Uh, good evening. Welcome to the January 24th, 2024 meeting of the Wilmington School Committee. Uh, all members are in attendance with the exception of Jennifer Bryson. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the, the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to, to the, the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item is student representatives from the high school, Madison and Jackson. Hello and thank you for having us back once again. Today I have Jackson Kiley here to present with me. Mid-year exams are now over. They began on Thursday of last week and they ended yesterday. The school days were shortened Friday or Thursday through today because today was ACIT day. Today also marks the start of quarter three, meaning if students took any half year courses, their new ones began today. The chess club announced that they will be hosting chess lessons and a chess tournament at the Wilmington Memorial Library, both open to players of all ages and skill. The lessons will take place January 31st at 3.30 and the tournament February 7th at 3.30. The class of 2026 and the Woburn Chipotle are having a fundraiser. On February 6th from 4 to 8 p.m., 33% of sales placed online for pickup will be donated when you use the class's code or show the flyer at the restaurant. The December Students of the Month were announced this month. All students selected fit the category of contributor. The students were Gracie Giamarco, Matthew Abbott, Marcel Shapiro, Skylar Estabrook, Connor Crane, Adam Alfazi, Daniel McGilligott, Tara Lawrence, Jenna G. Marco, Adam Belize, Connor Moyer, and Adonia Desenshi. The WHS band will once again be going on their ski trip to Pat's Peak on February 2nd. And if you have been to some of the hockey or basketball games recently, you may have noticed the pep band playing. In other sports news, congratulations to Lily McKenzie for scoring her 100th varsity point for the girls hockey team. Congratulations to our robotics team. We had three competing teams and all placed in within top five spots. And congratulations to high school junior Bob Bush as well. He's a finalist for the Mass Association of Mathematics League Olympiad Level 1 exam. He ranked 85 out of over 700 students who took the exam and will be moving on to the Level 2 exam in February. The Middle School Drama Club put on their production of The Little Mermaid this past Thursday through Saturday at the high school auditorium. Their Saturday show was com sold out completely and the entire show was a complete success. The High School Drama Club is now rehearsing for Newsies as of yesterday. The, Wild, the Wildwood MSBA project has a community input session on February 1st at 6.30, uh, and registration has opened for all summer enrichment courses. Some of the courses include robotics, computer-aided design, and high school drama workshop, workshop among others. Uh, vision and hear, hearing screeners were done for all 10th grade students on January 10th and 11th. All of, the serving excuse me, all of the service learning projects have officially been completed and students protect, presented about their projects. At the beginning of the semester, students identified something that they were passionate about and then they spent the semester working to help the issue. Overall, there were 23 projects completed, some of which included a food drive, um, collaboration with the DEA for substance abuse, a guest speaker, a diaper and wipe drive, and fundraising for the Parkinson's Foundation were just some of the projects completed. One of the projects was also to raise awareness for drug addictions, and on January 8th, Brian O'Keefe, a former DEA agent, came in and spoke to the students during W2. Thank you for having us. Do you have any questions? Any comments, Ms. Burns? I, I, would, I was I'm curious about the um, Brian O'Keefe. Yes. Um, so can you tell me a little bit, um, if I don't know if you attended or not, but you can just tell me, share with us um, some of the feedback from that presentation and what you may have, uh, you know, uh, gotten from it, I, I guess the... Yeah, um, I, I found it to be I very... I couldn't good. attend, did, I, I did you? Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, the same day we had a delayed start, so it was kind of rushed, but basically he showed us the difference between a actual, like, facility where, like, medicine, like, drugs are made and where, and, like, and like the difference in like cleanliness between um, like a real medical grade facility and the I can't think of the word uh, the home the home shops kind of thing yeah and I he, al he also showed us the difference between like real and fake 
pills and how you can't tell the difference because um, like the, I, st I can't think of any <laughs> words, but like the, the, how the two different pills look so similar, like the illegal ones to the real ones that they're trying to imitate. Indeed, yeah. very good. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. brings us to our consent agenda. Um, are there any items that the committee wishes to take out for discussion before we <clears throat> vote on the consent agenda? All right, then we will vote on uh, approval of the January 17th, 2024 minutes from our regular session. Uh, approval of policies EA, sorry, EEAEA, I, drug and alcohol testing for school and bus commercial vehicle drivers. Uh, EEAEC, student conduct on school buses, EEAG, student transportation and private vehicles, EFD, meal, change, meal charge policy, uh, GBA, equal employment opportunity, and then we have the following warrants to approve, revolving 32, local 59, 60, and 61, food service 36, circuit breaker 15, and special education 30 and 31. Do I have a motion? Motion by Mr. Turner, seconded by Mr. Fennelly. All in favor? <coughs> and that is unanimous. <coughs> that brings us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Brand. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. There are three items uh, this evening under the report, um, all of which have items to accompany them in the packet, uh, and I'll go in order. The first um, is the 2022-23 uh, Wilmington Public Schools annual report for the town. A rather extensive document, but one that <coughs> we're pretty uh, proud of uh, in terms of uh, an effort to try and showcase for the residents and community members um, all of the many things that were accomplished and uh, I think achieved across our school district last year. Uh, the request for this report is an annual request from the town, uh, and they like to uh, compile the departmental uh, reports, if you will. And so it's a year of looking back, a uh, year of reflection or, or in, in, in the rearview mirror. I want to thank... Um, uh, all of the folks who contributed to this, um, as, you, it's, as you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of work that went into it. Um, thanks to Ms. Ingersoll for her pulling it together. Uh, Ms. Elliott, who works to try and coordinate all of uh, the various folks who contribute to this. And uh, a lot of great information that, um, even though uh, is now a little bit behind us, um, still, I think, uh, lots to pause and take a look at. So we're pretty pleased with um, the direction that this is, is taking as a report. Um, the next item is um, uh, procedures for school committee questions in advance of the meetings, and uh, you'll note that I included a, a memo in the packet regarding this. Um, it is not lost upon me of a couple of things. Number one, there's an awful lot of uh, work, a lot of topics that flow through this committee on a regular basis, and um, certainly knowing very well the, uh, the, the intent for the members of this committee to be highly engaged in and aware of the content and um, as always, a lot of great questions seeking sort of understanding and clarity and, and maybe further information. Um, it's also uh, important to me that as, as committee members, you're taking time to review the packets in advance of these meetings. And um, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes there are questions from members of the committee. Um, and it's important for, for myself as your superintendent and members of our team to make sure we're responsive to those. Uh, sometimes those are questions, obviously, that provide just greater understanding. Um, sometimes they're helpful to frame the discussion or, or an action that you may be uh, wishing, we may, as administration, ask you to take. So as outlined in the memo, um, trying to be thoughtful about this, um, one adjustment, as you'll note there, uh, th is the effort to try and move up the release of the packet a day earlier. Um, uh, for a good number of years now, uh, we've been at a, usually a Friday release of the packet informations, and um, I, I get it that that's also very tight and close to the weekend when it's family time and time away from work and this is obviously a volunteer role so hopefully a little bit more time might be helpful for you. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, you know, the effort to try and provide some sort of time frame in which um, if, you, if as members of the committee you do have questions to try and be able to uh, share those with the administrative mm -hmm. teams then that allows us in turn chance to generate the responses and then get them back to you. Um, so with that, um, the suggestion around um, sort of a guideline or structure of how to sort of break these questions out, 
And again, this is all in the spirit of trying to be responsive, to try and help um, set you up as best as you can to come into these meetings, to be ready and prepared. And sometimes you know that there's questions that may be helpful that you're thinking of to share with the presenter, whether that be myself or one of our, my colleagues. Um, that's helpful, as well as, of course, understanding that there are sometimes questions that um, just a, a response may be helpful um, ahead of the meeting. So happy to pause in this and take questions, comments, thoughts on, on this, trying to find that right balance of works best for, for everyone. Ms. Burns. Um, just a comment. Um, first <clears throat> off, I, I want to say I, I think the annual report came out fabulous. I think it's very engaging, easy to read, even with the heavy content of, of which is touched upon within that document, but it really, and um, Tracy? I, Tracy, I don't know what you're doing as a secretary because I'll tell you, you wonderful marketing materials, and it, it really is just very easy to read, very engaging. Here. I know, I know. Um, so, but I want to thank you because it was very well put together, and very the content in itself was very, grouped in such a way that I think um, will allow a, a lot of people who in other otherwise read it read it and, and engage in it. So I really I really do think that um, how it's presented is a, a big piece in ensuring that that information gets out <coughs> readily. Um, with regards to the, the procedures, um, with regards to the questions, um, first let me say I think I really do appreciate the <coughs> packet release being on Thursday. Um, it does offer me, I, I, just as one member um, with this change, does offer me that time again to be able to do research so there are less questions that go into, um, that get sent to you and go into the packet. So um, certain things, uh, it does offer that time frame which is not always touched upon um, when we prepare, um, but there's research um, that, go in, that does go into um, understanding um, how it, uh, not only how it impacts Wilmington but the broader pictures to the why it's being done. So, um, and I, I think, um, I'm, I think uh, two things that I think the we haven't um, started yet, we haven't met in quite a while, the um, school committee um, handbook for new members. I think this aspect, if we can maybe f take this time to kind of figure out what works, what you find from the seven of us coming to you, what might work to be able to meet um, the needs of um, promptly address, answering those questions, perhaps we can do re add an addition to that handbook. Um, and I ideally, um, for those who are on the on that subcommittee, um, ideally I would like to see if we can um, hit it, fin complete it before the um, before the end of spring. Um, just to um, send that out to subcommittee members. So, but other than that, but that's all I wanted to um, touch upon. Thank you, though. Other questions and comments, Mr. Turner. Um, first of all, I second everything uh, Ms. Burns said about the the. Um, annual report, I think that was fantastic and, and very well put together. I had reason to look back at prior ones and this one stands up very well and, and highlights even better some of the, 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 the current or recent past events. Um, the only thing I would ask, um, I do think this should go in the handbook. Uh, there are times when I have questions that are more about either general information that are, is not time sensitive and there's also times when I have questions about maybe next time we could do, and it's, so it's not urgent in the top category and it's not a heads up about something I'm going to ask. So there might be times when a third category of sure. also yeah. would fall under that as well. And so I just want to make sure that that's, you're comfortable with that type of thing where you can say, okay, I, I, back of the mind or get back to it later type comments. I, I mean, thank you for raising it and of course, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And that, this is not just about, um, just to be clear for, for everyone here and, and those watching, this is not just about trying to govern questions by committee members about anything of the business of the yeah. district. Um, this is more focused on um, the school committee packet information that we you know put together and released to you and the community. And knowing that the reality is, as you all know well, there's a very tight time window, right? In terms of from its release to the time that we meet and um, with a lot of members and sometimes more dense um, content, there can be a lot of questions. And um, that, again, it speaks to the level of engagement, I think, from members of the committee. But um, if, if you're working hard to generate those questions again, or if it's something that will be helpful for you for the conversation, 
we want to be responsive yeah. to that. So, um, but you. anytime, of course, there's always yeah. that window of opportunity okay. for questions. Perfect, thank you. And and the Thursday does help, just to be clear, one extra day is one extra day and, and give me more flexibility as to when to, to look into it. So, thank you. And I, I was actually going to bring up, if you if you had yeah. Stephen, the, uh, that sort of third category of, of questions that you had, because, you know, things that I need to know in advance of the meeting and things I intend to bring up or discuss is not the universe of questions you might have um, about the information in the packet. And so it's useful to have another place where we can kind of cabin some of those other questions that are still important and valuable, but that don't need to be you know, rushed before Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so that we, can, we can just have a proper um, prioritization of that. And then maybe highlighting, color coding them um, in emails if that's. We could do colors. I'm just saying, I, Red, I tried. yellow, green. In response to the, the meeting packet, I, I did try, and I will continue to strive hmm. to, um, but I thought it was easier to bounce off the page when, the, you know what I mean? But if we can come up with somewhat of a stand, because I made up my own personally this, <laughs> this go around this week, but if we can, if we can try to, if we can, great. If we can't, you know, I want, I just, I, you know, I think it's more important to ask the questions than, um, but, you know, I'm a little type A in that. I, th I think we should all have to send our questions in with an animated GIF that expresses <laughs> your, the level of anxiety you'll feel until you get the answer to that question. It, it Maybe just, um, what are they called, pictographs? <laughs> with like, uh, yeah. we go. Mr. Smile. That's okay, Tracy can um, send it, can formulate, format that for us, so. Uh, um, what, uh, along those lines, kind of what, what I was thinking about it is maybe just adding like a code and, and <clears throat> rather than having a color code but just a code because I know that sometimes when we get responses back the responses are like you know it's it's the email and the responses back in red and I'm, I'm worried that there's going to be just too much stuff if we did that so a simple you know um, what was I what was I saying what was I, th I don't know what thing is I'm um, like you know like uh, <clears throat> a P or an H like in parentheses before the question or after the question and then maybe, or you could even be like a one, two, three, now we're talking about like a third category. Just something yeah. to label each question so that we're, we're being clear that this is something I need before the meeting, right. or this is, this can wait, or this is that third category. Um, so that, it's actually good for us to think about it because sometimes when we ask questions, we might not even know, do I want that before the meeting or am I just saying that just because I want people to know the types of questions that I might ask? So that, that Doing something, I, I like your idea. I, I don't think color coding. Maybe highlighting it, the but question. Like, but doing something, something. like, I think, <clears throat> I think okay. like making it bold and putting up. We'll come up with some, uh, some yeah, We should some be thinking of a, some sort of system, I think. Perhaps is, we can figure it, figure it out and see which options uh, might work yeah. well. Yeah. This is recording. <clears throat> yeah, so I think I'll go backwards. So just to join the conversation on this, I, I figured just let's give it a shot, see how it works. If it doesn't work, we come back and we try something else. But mm -hmm. I thought the request was pretty reasonable. Yep. Um, and then to the uh, report, I just want to echo what MJ and uh, Stephen said. I found it very professional, very easy to read, really great marketing material, I think, for the district. So nice job on that. Yeah, so sort of to, to what Mike was just saying, I think, uh, and, you know, David and Glenn and I had a, a number of conversations about this before this. And so I, I – Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, I sort of looked at this as something we could revisit occasionally. Like, this might work, this might not work. We might find we do something better, we might find we do something worse. We had an idea that Glenn talked to Andy about and it could have violated open meeting laws, right? So there are any number of different ways to look at this. So I think, you know, we obviously as a committee want to be as efficient as we can. We want Glenn and his team's uh, time to be well spent. So. We try it and we'll see how it goes. And I think MJ, your uh, idea about putting it in the handbook is yep. is wonderful. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you. And uh, and one la one last thing I'll add to this is that, uh, in addition to just trying to make the process more manageable, one of the things that sort of we noticed is that there are a lot of really good questions and answers that are only going back and forth in email and aren't coming out in open meeting, and that a lot of these questions and the answers to them are really great questions to be asked and mm -hmm. given um, during the meeting itself. And so it's also also the benefit of that and, and having more of that discussion um, be here and, uh, and not just going back and forth in text. 
Thank right. you for that. Sure. Um, and then the third item, the West, an update on the West Intermediate Principal Search. Um, as members of the committee know, and many in the community, Dr. Foster, uh, Principal of the West has um, shared with us his intent to retire at the end of this current school year, so at the end of June. Uh, we have already posted for that position. Um, I want to again thank uh, Dr. Foster for coming to terms with that decision and allowing the district uh, considerable time to get out there and what hopefully will be on the leading edge of searches for principals. Um, it's always a, a, good, uh, a good jump to, to be able to have. Uh, the memo outlines the process that remains relatively consistent with how we, at least under my um, time here, have approached these uh, searches. Uh, these are multifaceted, and I think they, they need to be. They're obviously uh, critically important for a particular school community. So you can see the outline there that, um, uh, again, reflects um, the approach that we've taken in the recent past. Um, I want to take this opportunity and thank uh, the members of their community, the West community, who stepped forward to volunteer. And I won't read their names all in the interest of time, but you can see them listed there on the memo. Um, we have five uh, educators uh, slash staff members from the West, which is great. We have two parent guardian uh, representatives, two elementary administrators, and then, as has usually been the case, uh, Ms. Stern Armstrong, our director of HR, will be a member of the committee and really orchestrate um, the, the work. Uh, the position is, uh, was posted just before the winter break. You'll see the timeline there at the bottom of the memo. It remains open right now, uh, and my understanding, at least at the very beginning of this week, is that we had 21 applications in total, so that's, that's really encouraging, and there's still a small window of time before it closes. And then you can see the rest of the uh, the rest of the timeline there, uh, stretching out into mid mid March, um, in which it's anticipated that we'll uh, have a finalist announced. So, just want to bring you up to speed with that, um, and um, thank you again to those from the community who have stepped forward to get involved. And we will always, again, through this process, make other opportunities, even for those not sitting on the search committee, a chance to meet potential finalists and provide feedback in this important selection process. So unless there are any questions on that, um, that's it for the superintendent's report tonight. Dr. McCauley. Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, how many applicants have you received so far for the position? Uh, 20, 21 as of earlier this week. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Good luck. <laughs> Mr. Slaha. I, I have one question. I don't necessarily need an answer right now, but just sort of thinking about this is the this, the data that was collected in the survey about the characteristics the community is looking for. Yep. I'm, I'm curious what that looked like. So, yeah, so, I, and we, we'll provide you with that. I haven't had a chance to work okay. with Mr. and Armstrong to pull those responses together, but what we have done in the past, and there'd be no reason to de deviate from that, is to pull that together in a, in a brief report. Um, I don't know what the response rate is on that in on this moment, but uh, and to compile that, um, you know, anonymously. Well, it was an anonymous survey, but to compile that first to share with the members of the search committee mm -hmm. as a framework uh, for you know who, based upon the feedback, who really the type of the profile of the type of ideal candidate. Mm -hmm. um, that's not meant to be secretive at all, and so we'll compile that and share that um, with the West community uh, at some point in the very near future. Thank you. Questions or comments? All right, and that brings us to public comment. Mr. Fennelly. There was uh, no public comment submitted in advance of the meeting, and no members of the community signed up to uh, deliver a public comment. But as always, if anybody would like to. Okay. Very good. Next, we move to item seven, new business, and we're going to take these items uh, out of order. And the uh, draft calendar discussion to the um, to the end of new business. So we are going to start with the uh, high school schedule review and program of studies. So, so just as Mr. context, as uh, Mr. Jenner and his team, sorry, yeah. if I may uh, come yeah, come on forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, come forward. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> This, as some reminder, um, annually it is the case the program of studies for the high school comes before the committee uh, for uh, approval for the following school year. Um, we're, believe it or not, we're at that typical point in time uh, of the school year in which this is um, has been the case in, in, I think, for a number of years now. So that's number one, but then number two, there's a point of connection with this as you have a little bit of insight and Mr. Jenner and his team will share with us, and that is a proposal to revise the schedule. 
uh, for the high school. They go hand in hand, um, and so we thought it would be a good idea to bundle them together and provide you and the community with insight uh, in terms of some of the thinking and planning uh, to continue to move the high school forward. So welcome, folks. Mr. Jen. Great. Great. Nice to see everyone again. Uh, it's great to be back to present both the program of studies and go a little bit more in detail on the schedule change that we alluded to in the December meeting um, as part of the school improvement plan. Um, as Dr. Brand explained, they go hand in hand, and so I think it's important to understand one to understand the proposals with the other. I had promised that the schedule review team um, and Mr. Staffier, who led them, would be here. Uh, to present this, but uh, something came up with Mr. Staff here, and I am here to present. But want to acknowledge uh, all the staff members from the high school on that team who have worked uh, really over a period of three years uh, on this schedule proposal. Uh, so it's kind of exciting to see their work come together. Um, so we'll talk about the timeline of this schedule, the concerns with the current schedule, and the uh, proposal as it is. Just a quick recap of the timeline. So uh, this schedule proposal predates me. Um, in 2021, during the NEASC visit, um, the, revisiting the schedule was one of their recommendations. Um, the quote that they used is to ensure that the current schedule is working for all students and staff. And over uh, a period of years, the schedule review committee analyzed the current schedule and determined that it's not, uh, for some reasons we'll look at together right now. Um, Immediately, that committee came together. They um, collected 33 that I could find. I think they probably looked at more than 33 local high school schedules, um, looking at how many courses are on the schedule, the use of flex time, and a number of other things. Um, at the end of that first year of work, they recommended an 8.0 schedule with the power block, uh, which is the proposal we're going to look at tonight. Um, that was the year um, when Ms. Peters um, and her retirement happened and the transition to a new uh, leadership uh, and new principal occurred. So if you look at that 22-23 year, that was my first year last year. And Ms. Peters was really clear with me that the, the committee had done a lot of work, that they had identified some gaps in the schedule and the plan to seek a new one. But she didn't feel like it was the um, appropriate thing to make that change immediately before I kind of came to the building. So I appreciate her having the patience and vision to like create that year to see it in action. Um, last year, the review committee proposed this schedule. And again, this year, they proposed this schedule. So. Uh, I feel like I understand it very clearly from the staff and student and family point of view. Uh, and so we'll start with the schedule drawback. So what you see here is the current schedule. It's referred to as a blue-white schedule, but um, technically there are four iterations because on blue one and white one, blue one and white one are the first blocks. Uh, and then in blue four and white four, the first and the last blocks flip. Um, the concern that arises here um, has to do with restrictions in the number of blocks that are in this schedule. Um, the fact that white two is the flex time constricts our white day schedule in a unique way that restricts symmetry uh, and creates unequal distributions. There's also concerns that 84 minutes of continuous flex time is not the most efficient uh, or practical use of flex time. Um, not all students have access to W-2 flex time, and actually some like protected groups of students don't, uh, which is problematic. Um, and the lack of blocks in this schedule limit our ability to schedule staff members to have uh, professional learning communities and collaboration time on content teams. Um, to look at like a student schedule, and I apologize here that you can't see the colors as well, um, but this schedule, uh, in all except the blue four, box are filled in with requirements. Um, so in grades 9 through 11, assuming they're taking world language, most colleges recommend three years of world language, all but one block are automatically filled in with school requirements. That does leave an elective block. However, that elective block is automatically consumed if a student is non in, on an IEP and has a learning center. That has to land in that block. Uh, students in performing arts, um, those are, you know, typically a four-year commitment, it has to land in that block. Mm. Um, and every time that something has to land there, it restricts the student's opportunity to explore other things in our very diverse uh, program of studies. Um, and, and sometimes the, the comment comes up that, well, it's an elective and that student chose to um, use it on performing arts. Um, but, you know, 
we don't believe that being in performing arts should preclude you from studying business or from going more in depth with an English writing elective or, or something along those lines. Um, you know, jazz band students are actually the most restricted. They have to take their band during that elective. There's nowhere for the jazz band to occur, so it actually occurs during W2, and those students lose their flex time. So um, problematic from that regard. Also problematic from the teacher's perspective. Um, teachers have to have one of the four blocks off for prep. Um, as you can see here, there's very limited space for that to happen, especially on white days. W2 and flex time, all teachers are on during that time, so it's like considered an on block. So they only have space for two classes on their schedule on white days. That immediately throws our whole master schedule out of balance, um, and it results in teachers and students having very heavy blue days. Uh, this is the proposed schedule, um, so it basically adds a block um, and spreads flex block over both days. Uh, for simplicity's sake, you see it here, but it's still proposed as the first and last block alternating on um, blue four and white four. It shortens the class time to 74 minutes, uh, which positively responds to concerns from students and staff that while the move to a block schedule uh, allows for deeper sustained learning, the 85 minutes is long um, and significantly different in terms of classroom management and instructional planning than the proposed 40, 40 excuse me, 74 minutes. Similarly, breaking flex block out of the once um, for 84 minutes into an everyday for 48 minutes um, is intended to create some um, rhythm in having an everyday predictability, but not that long sustained period of time. We talked at um, the school improvement plan meeting around arriving at that 48 minutes, which is, if you add them up, a slight expansion. Um, but beyond 48 minutes, um, for a lot of the uses that students um, and the school are using that flex time, not only retakes and reteaching, but also school counseling seminars and other programming, um, the schedule review committee felt like that was the, the best balance of time. Um, additionally, um, when you look at a student schedule, they will still have one block that might still be consumed by some of those prior commitments I already described, but it adds an additional elective slot uh, where they can explore more of the career clusters, more of the program of studies, or really specialize and build uh, you know, a, a personalized transcript in an area of their choosing. Um, in this model, no classes will need to run during W2 and flex time, so all students in the building will have that. Uh, is what I need time. Uh, the other thing I would note here is that um, students will now be taking an additional class, which does impact uh, our class sizes and staffing. Uh, if anything, it's a more uh, efficient use of our staffing uh, because teachers will, um, you know, have uh, closer to a full class load, um, which is positive for the interactions happening in that classroom, for the classroom dialogue, the interactions amongst students. Um, and so it's a more efficient use of our existing staffing. If you look at the 8.0 teacher schedule, you see that every day they have uh, a prep similar to the current uh, contractual requirements, but there's also an additional block off where we're, we'll be able to extract their duties, which they're currently doing <coughs> during their prep block, and have a dedicated duty block. That allows those prep and CPT blocks to be undisturbed, uh, which is in alignment with NEASC's other recommendations about making, making sure that the school creates common planning time uh, for teachers, especially on same content teams, to collaborate together. While we probably don't have space to have like the whole science department off at that time, we can definitely have like the ninth grade bio team off at that time, uh, or the ninth grade uh, global one team. So, so <laughs> it'll take a lot of planning on Mr. Miranda's part, but um, this structure <laughs> allows that to happen. Uh, and that's the side-by-side. -side. Um, in the big picture, there's um, a lot more than just changing the structure. Um, we're viewing this as adding one class but rebalancing the other seven. So this isn't just a net add to student schedule. Uh, it does include both a time and curriculum um, consolidation of some units to make sure um, we're not just piling on an extra class for students. Um, staff will have uh, CIT time um, to modify the curriculum, uh, CIT day and department and faculty meeting time. 
Uh, I also think during uh, the previous presentation, I talked about how not all 85 minutes of every class right now are being utilized in a super effective way. There are almost some like uh, accommodating practices that have evolved to try to help teachers and students manage that really long period of time. Um, so we don't think that in all cases this is going to be a curriculum <coughs> reduction. Uh, we also developed an expectations chart, which you'll see in the proposed program of studies. The purpose of that is to increase consistency amongst uh, same level classes. Uh, we have um, observed that even in um, the same content area or um, two different college prep classes, the workload and the homework load can um, vary pretty significantly. So the goal of this expectations chart is to note how the levels are different, uh, but also how they are the same across teachers, ac across content areas, to create uh, common expectations and continuity for students, families, and teachers. Um, the school counselors um, will be an integral part of uh, making sure that this doesn't turn into a net ad for students. The school counselors, um, <coughs> meet one-on-one -on -one with students as part of the course selection process, and they will be counseling against overloading. Um, this additional slot is intended to be an elective slot. Um, it's not intended to be you know, a heavy, heavy workload. Um, in the past, the school counseling office has observed that um, you know, some of our uh, most ambitious students who look to really create a um, pretty challenging schedule um, will schedule up to four AP classes. Um, and there are some who even ask about five, and five seems to be the tipping point that we've observed where, um, you know, the performance tends to uh, suffer and the outcomes are not as positive as um, students who take on that four. So we've added language about a waiver for five APs to really be consistent with our messaging that this additional slot is not meant to overload schedules. Mm -hmm. It's instead intended for elective space. Um, and one thing I want to make sure we acknowledge is that AP courses um, do have like a start and a finish um, that uh, students across the country are expected to cover in preparation for the AP test. Here in the Northeast, we actually have less time uh, to cover that curriculum than other departments. Uh, we're aware of that. Our AP teachers are aware of that. And we're looking at how we can use enrichment time during those flex blocks, especially on a schedule to make sure they're not all doing it on the same day to provide additional practice, um, more in-depth study on a more uh, enrichment basis to try to offset some of that time change. Um, so we're at the program of studies phase of this next steps. Um, we've got a lot of input on this schedule. Um, they've helped to tweak and evolve it as we've gone. Uh, we had a student, um, in, uh, student input opportunity during W2. We had a virtual forum of families in the evening. Uh, we've spent um, you know, department and faculty meeting time getting um, you know, this proposal polished up as close as it can be. And we're now at kind of the implementation phase where um, the impacted changes will need to get worked into the program of studies. I think that's why uh, the program of studies we're talking about tonight has probably more changes than normal. Uh, and this many changes won't be a new normal. Uh, it's kind of like a transitionary period. Um, and later, when we talk about the student handbook, there'll be adjustments that need to go in as well. Um, so I know that's a lot, um, but I want to make sure that you and everyone watching at home, you know, is up to speed on a lot of the great work that the team has been working on. Um, and certainly, if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to address them at this time. Question or comments? Ms. Burns. So um, first and foremost, and I'll piecemeal this, I thank you very much for um, being so diligent in answering <coughs> the deluge of questions I sent to you. Um, I, I would, I think, benefit, and I think I understand there's one particular question with regards to um, several years ago there was a big push for 90-minute um, for core classes, which I believe was, was the recommendation from DESI, and it, and it directly correlated with um, MCAS state um, scores, but it was also, and this building in itself was created um, for, to give more time to uh, collaborative project-based um, hand, um, hands-on learning so that um, teachers could break out and have um, students collaborate in groups and I think the second floor I haven't been up on the second floor since the opening of the high school but um, there are there are push out spaces 
for that to transpire. So they're not always sitting in the classroom and, um, and to meet that 90 minutes. So I think that's where I couldn't, I didn't realize exactly, well, you know, Nick Nias came in, but that was after that DESI recommendation of pushing it, you know what I mean, creating uh, 90 minute um, sessions in core classes. I personally have to say, I, um, I much prefer the schedule for all the host of reasons that you've touched upon, um, primarily for common um, meeting times with teachers for PLCs, which um, as we know, we've, we, we've heard for years with our teachers, we need that common planning time for each other, um, with one another uh, for curriculum base. And, but but it's, it's, it speaks more to team-based building as well. And um, so, but, um, so, and granted, um, I much prefer this schedule than the, um, than if it's the 90 minute, the 90 minutes in a core class, uh, in a, you know, if that's not being utilized and our students don't learn in that capacity, then I, I, anything that sometimes is rebellious against Desi is, is good with me. Anyway, he, he works for MCAS. We're not talking about MCAS. So, but, um, but I want to say I thank you and I applaud um, coming up with a schedule that would benefit not only our students but our staff um, in the process. Dr. Mercaldi. Thanks. Yeah, so I'd just like to echo uh, what uh, Ms. Burns was saying. You know, I thought the schedule looks pretty good. You know, obviously a lot of effort, time went into that. Uh, I think question for you all is, sounds like there's a lot of positives. You talked about one drawback being the AP courses, but any other drawbacks or risks that you know we should be aware about? Yeah, I think um, one is that they, uh, you know, last year um, as part of the budget process and the enrollment changes, there were some staffing reductions, um, and and in this model, uh, maybe as a result of some of the inefficiencies of the schedule. Um, still, the class sizes were not overloaded. They're well below kind of the contractual limits. Um, I made a comment about this new schedule more efficiently using or maximizing our staffing. Uh, and we do anticipate that most of the classes will fill up better closer to the contractual limits. Uh, but there has been uh, more space, I would say, in, in the class sizes than um, there typically is in high school schedules. And so this will be more similar. Um, but it might lead to less uh, space for movement. Um, I would imagine like uh, a we're having a lot of students transferring in at this point in the school year and the number of uh, elective choices or space in schedules for students transferring in in January will be much tighter uh, than it is in, in this current model. Um, so we certainly think we can fit, you know, we're not concerned about not fitting all the seats and all the tallies, but um, it'll be a different amount of flexibility, um, especially later in the process. That makes sense. So, so if I can understand you, it'd be benefit that we're actually gonna fill out some of these electives, but the detriment is that there might not be space for other students potentially because we are gonna fill these courses out. Am I right in interpreting Well, I don't way? think that there won't be space, but I think yeah. there'll be less flexibility, less gotcha. space. Okay, Yeah. all right, cool, thank you. Okay. Mr. Fenneman? Uh, thank you, uh, great presentation. Um, Two, uh, and, and my first question, I think you said this process started before you, so if you don't know, that's acceptable. Uh, but you mentioned <clears throat> 33 local high schools. Local to the area, are they local like as in comparable sizes and enrollments? Mm -hmm. Is it both? How did that kind of shake out? Yep, uh, fortunately, uh, Molly Dickerson, <laughs> school counseling at CTL to my left, and Jonathan Miranda, assistant principal to my right, uh, were here at this time. I don't know if either of you want to speak to kind of the sampling of other school schedules. Um, so we took the idea from Desi and, and what Desi identifies as local schools. <clears throat> there was a, a list that Dr. Brand had given us that schools similar to our demographic, not necessarily schools that Desi would compare us to. And then local, regional, Andover, Reading, North Reading, Billerica. So really is a, a pretty good sampling, sure. <clears throat> pardon me, of um, schools in the area. 33 that were identified. There were more than that. Yeah. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of time identifying other places and visiting and thinking about that. Yeah, that's kind of I was. That's kind of what I was looking for is that it, it was a good sample size, but that it was, you know, sort of uh, representative of. So thank you. Um, the last one sort of uh, piggybacks what uh, 
Dr. McCauley was saying, as far as uh, potential downsides or negatives, what are the thoughts from the staff? I mean, it seems like this is beneficial to the staff. Are there concerns that the staff have about moving to this new model or? Um, no, uh, it's, it's been pretty overwhelming support, um, including from the general staff, but I should also like specify from the WTA sure. uh, and our building reps. Um, there have been some um, like really specific questions about how this will impact, you know, uh, like we have the reader leader programming going to the other schools and that really benefits from the 84 minute block. Mm -hmm. So it's not a concern, it's just something we'll have to tweak and work out. Um, some questions about some other courses, um, not so much as part of the schedule change, more of the program of studies changes. So a couple of specific uh, things we gotta sort out, but um, in terms of kind of like the engagement impact of the shorter classes and um, students being able to uh, pursue their passions, like those things seem to have outweighed some of the more specific uh, questions. Great, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Turner. So first of all, thank you all and the whole team. I, I, I really do think this is a great idea um, and, and a way to balance what W2 is and what it can be and what it should be. Um, I do, it's, it overlaps with the program of studies, but certainly the expectation charts and being more consistent across CP honors and AP I think is a, a very good thing. Um, the one other place that I had heard historically where the longer class benefited besides AP was also in science labs. Mm -hmm. Was there any concern with those? Because those are some of the things where just once you set it up, you need to finish it. It's, I, I know it's nine minutes, it's not a huge drop, but is, was there any concern from the science department on the lab side of things? Um, so, uh, essentially, no, because the nine minutes doesn't drastically change it. I think if we tried to go back to 45-minute classes or 50-minute classes, that would be so significant of a change that they wouldn't be able to work it in. Yeah. Um, being, you know, three or four minutes tighter on the front end and the back end, um, that hasn't been raised as, like, a real significant um, cost of this change. Sure. Uh, there was uh, at least one science teacher on the review committee, and so that hasn't emerged as like a significant holdup. Okay. Um, it's something we can continue to like monitor and explore. Um, some schools as part of their schedule have like additional blocks attached to the science block, and so uh, it's something we can definitely monitor um, and tweak as we go. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smaha. Um, again, yeah, thank you, and I feel, <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like if I just go into my questions, I'd say thank you, because I really do appreciate the presentation. That would be just <laughs> neglectful in some way. Um, I, I totally support the schedule. I think, it makes, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things, and I think that you alluded to it as well, in terms of um, special education students um, who have that I think the, the learning center block, like this is gonna allow those students to still get those services, but also get um, some elective time in there, which right now they, they don't have. And I think in some ways that mirrors what happened at the middle school level um, and, and some of their schedule changes um, just to sort of equal things out and allow just because a kid has, you know, needs the learning center doesn't mean that they don't have other interests and stuff. So I think that's a really important part to highlight and one of the one of the things that I really like about this new schedule. Um, I think um, on a similar note, as a parent of a kid in the jazz band, like, you know, like he, ha he has no flexibility in his schedule. He's like jam-packed. And I think, um, of course, he's graduating, but <laughs> <laughs> so this, this won't impact him. But, you know, like for, for a student in his Sorry. same situation, um, I think it would be, it would it would have allowed, because he's, you know, my son has a lot of interests, and I think that would have allowed him to sort of expand uh, even more. So I like that. Part of the other comment that I have um, is in terms of, you were talking about the expectations sort of being balanced across the different types of classes. And I think by, I think in addition, adding the, the CPT time, so if you're saying you could get all of the ninth grade bio teachers together, that means you're getting the ninth grade, you know, uh, honors level, CP level, whatever the levels are, um, together to have a, have a set aside time to have those conversations so they can be talking about, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, so I think you're going to see, I think that's a, a definite bonus to this. Um, my thinking about the AP stuff, um, I would want to know, because I know that there was, a, there was a lot of talk about looking at those other 33 schools and their schedules, 
but there was also talk about what are the course offerings at lots of other schools. Um, and I'm curious, we, the, you know, what do other schools do for AP who have shorter than 84 minute blocks? Like how do they get there? Schools in our, you know, in our area who have the same yearly schedule constraints. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to refer back and get some of their expertise, but I, I know that um, you know we're trying to be over the top with making sure we have everything worked out just right. I've talked to other AP teachers in the building who are, who will say 85 minutes is a long time. We're going to trim it. We're going to be concise. It's not going to be that big of an impact on my AP class. So I also don't want to overblow, you know, like uh, over exaggerate, you know that that our AP is really hanging on figuring out how to use right. W2 time. There are a lot of teachers who are confident they're gonna make this transition smoothly. Um, we just wanna kind of provide more support and more structure than necessary uh, in case there are places where it's more difficult. But um, we can go back um, with the schedule review committee, find out the answer to that question. I just don't know. I mean, I'm just, I mean it's, just, it's just something to, to, to think about. Yeah. I think you've all been suitably thanked by the committee, so, uh, so I'm going to hold off on, on the okay. additional, additional thanks. Um, the, um, I, I, the benefits clearly seem to so outweigh the potential detriments here that this, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of these, you know, oh, you know, the best time to have done this would have been years in the past. The second best time is as soon as possible, which will be, you know, next year. Um, but it's, it's out, it, it, it seems great. The, I mean, I think the biggest concern that I had, you have addressed in great depth, which is the additional work and making sure that we're not adding additional burdens onto, uh, onto students. The, you know, having the new class times be so close to the old times is, is a great benefit in that teachers are not gonna have to radically rework their syllabi and how they, how they teach their classes. They have to be mindful, but it's not you know, a major overhaul. But that also brings along the danger that it's also easy to just sort of try to go along and still give the same assignments and not necessarily be thinking that like, oh, there's this extra course that a lot of students um, are going to have. And, and again, this is clearly front and center um, in, your, in your thinking and in your concerns. And, uh, and I, um, I'm, I'm glad that it is because I think that's a really important part of making sure that this uh, that this really works out the way the the way that we hope it does. And also, Ms. Dickerson, I think that the the additional work that the school counselors are going to do with the students, and also, um, you know, preparing them for uh, for this extra um, elective option that they're going to have, I think, is also going to be a, a really important point. So I'm I'm very very pleased that the school counseling department is so deeply involved in uh, in in this work as well. Um, you know, for years I've looked through the program of studies and. Just that, wow, it's so many great classes. And then you sort of find the reality. It's like, ah, uh, that people don't have room in their schedules to take, mm -hmm. especially if you're in band or orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is, I think, a, a, really, um, a really great move forward. So thank you. See, I'll thank great. you. Great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's just the appetizer thank to you. the program of studies. Um, so uh, as I noted, uh, the you got a lot for the program of studies. Last year, uh, it was mentioned that you prefer the red line edit so you can see exactly what was adjusted. Um, you know, the thank yous go to a lot of people for managing that mega document. Um, you know, the teachers in the courses propose changes that, you know, based on how the course is going. The CTLs help organize it for the departments. Um, Mr. Miranda, Mr. Staffier help uh, kind of coordinate and get those things into the document. Um, the school counseling office kind of helps across all departments to make sure that there's consistency. Uh, and certainly my assistant, Sue Murray, um, you know, gets all of those edits into the document, um, which as you can see is a Herculean affair. So thank you to all those people. Um, I attempted in the packet uh, to also provide a summary, uh, which tries to categorize all of these changes by um, department organization and then types of edits. Um, I think for the people listening at home, um, a quick overview of the broad summary. We updated the program descriptions for college prep, honors, and advanced placement courses to more accurately describe the experience of students. We developed a course level expectations chart to communicate clear expectations for students, staff, and families. We updated the total credits and elective credit requirements to reflect the impact of the new schedule. 
We updated the school counseling page to more concisely describe their offerings. Uh, we increased the consistency of elective offerings and organization. Uh, and then we had lots of department-specific course additions, course removals, title, description, and level changes. Um, and all those things are noted both in detail and in general in the packet. Uh, there's a lot, so I'm happy to uh, provide clarification or answer questions um, related to those program of studies changes, too. Ms. Burns. Um, again, I thank you so very much for responding to the uh, war and peace uh, amount of questions I posed to you. <laughs> um, I, I, I just wanted, I guess, the, really there's only two um, follow-up questions that I, I guess one's a com more a comment. Um, pertaining to, um, it's page 43 of the slide, um, <coughs> I think it's 32 <coughs> of the program of study, page 32, under recreational sports. Mm -hmm. um, I know you, um, I, you, you I, I appreciate you recognizing where my concern was, uh, the way I read it and I interpreted it. And I, I, I would, um, uh, and I def certainly defer to you, um, language around, I don't want it, the dis course description to um, to dissuade anybody of any physical um, uh, abilities, of, you know, whether it, it encompasses uh, physical or mental or, you know, any, to, to not consider that, um, you know, and that might, and it, that too may um, actually uh, boast for the questions as to what type of sports would, you know, would that um, encompass, which would, I think would help make certain students decide whether or not it's something they want to pursue or not. Um, but I, I, again, I just, I say that as just a point of reference. Um, and um, I, um, and I, I thank you for your clarification and, under, um, and a broader understanding. Um, I, 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 cause I don't want to be, um, don't want to misunderstand the, um, bi the biology MCAS review course. I think it's fabulous. I, I think it's absolutely fabulous, especially with regards to what the MCAS um, data points, and it's not just us, it's throughout the state. And I think that may bode well for just giving us that momentum and push forward um, going forth, you know what I mean, in our sciences, all of our sciences. Um, I, I wonder, and it's, and it's probably not a, a, dis, um, a topic for this discussion, so I would defer, but um, again, as I, concerns for students who may not have passed their 10th uh, grade uh, MCAS in the other uh, testing subjects. I, you know, I wonder if there's um, some other um, area of enrichment that we could offer those students, whether it be like an after school um, type of programming. Um, I don't know, forgive me if, I don't know if that's something currently offered or not, but um, I, I, just, I just think that, you know, I think we wanna see every child succeed and granted, and MCAS is only one measure. You know, it, it's not all the, the measures that we, as our district and our staff do on student learning, but it is something, again, um, that's, man, you know, mandatory for graduation. So I just, I, I put that out, it's just a, a, a thought that that would be great to, to see to make, um, and I know that there's a lot of work that is currently being done within the school day for those students as well. I recognize that, but um, I just thought, um, uh, to touch upon that, um, and um, and I and um and then lastly on uh, page uh, seventy nine um, of the slides, uh, it's the program of study page sixty eight, um, pertaining to the theater performance, the full time, um, the full year and half year. Um, I I think um, if you don't mind just looking at that language because it 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 does kind of read to me like it, there's a requisite when there really isn't. Um, you know what I mean? I just think, yeah. and it's just one way, what, and I offer that only what, as one person who doesn't know the description reading it. It just, um, it just kind of maligned me thinking, well, is there a requisite or is it in there? But I, I thank you for the additional clarification because it's, yeah. it's, it's greatly appreciated. And thank you and, and your team and your staff for the time in, in coming up with a, a, a program of studies that will engage and motivate our students in expanding their, um, in wanting to expand their interests and broadening their horizons to different experiences within our uh, within our high school, so I thank you so very much. I, I'm grateful, sincerely. Great, and thank you for that feedback. You're welcome.
Dr. Barcaldi. Thanks. Is that my timer? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so just to kind of echo what Ms. Byrne says, uh, really great critical review of this. I think a lot of the changes made are really great spot on. Uh, a couple just small things I noticed, and I was wondering if I can bring those up for discussion. So on the first page, program descriptions, um, the academically motivated language, uh, I was wondering if that can be changed. So it's present for the honors and the AP, mm -hmm. but it's not in the college prep. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of thinking like, by calling out this language here, may convey the message that the students in the college prep are not really motivated by academics in a way. Um, so don't know if there could be maybe a different way to convey the intent there. You're referring to the chart? No. Uh, I think or it was in the text. Okay. Um, if I scroll up and take a look. Mm -hmm. Final, it's page 11. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. think that's a good uh, point. Uh, I think the intent there is to highlight kind of the voluntary nature um, of wanting to take on additional yeah. uh, coursework. Uh, but that's not to say that another student is not academically motivated. Mm -hmm. So I think we can stick to describing the environment and the intent of um, the student. So that's yeah. good feedback. Yeah, that sounds, sounds good. And then uh, similar, under the college prep, I was wondering if you wanted to consider changing this to college and career prep and mm. kind of notice in the paragraph, the end of the paragraph describing ended in college and career prep. So kind of can convey to some of the students that, you know, like, yeah, everything that we're not offering here at the high school is for college bound students. Like if you want to go work, this is what you can do too. Yep, absolutely. That's um, something that uh, our team had a lot of conversation about actually. Um, uh, the two kind of prevailing thoughts were to move to a college and career prep label for that uh, level of course. Uh, the other was to remove the label altogether and that being our standard level of course without a honors tag or an advanced placement tag, that is our English nine course. Um, I learned a bit uh, from Ms. Dickerson about how um, those tags are meaningful in the college application process where students have to select what level of course they took and there's a defined drop down. Sure. Um, college prep and standard being kind of the industry standards. Do you wanna explain? <laughs> You sure. can probably explain it better than me. Yeah. Um, Although, how was I doing? Because no, you talked to me. That's good. Well, he's a very good lesson, or he's a good learner, or both. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things we looked at is our the common application, which our students use um, almost exclusively to apply to college. And then um, there's something called an SRAR, which more colleges are requiring now, where students report their own coursework as part of the application in addition to a transcript. So like we still send the transcript, but the student is expected to enter all of their coursework. Um, and both of those platforms right now have a list of sort of what they expect to see as a course level. And they all include college prep. Um, the second most common option is standard or regular. And then there's honors, IB, AP. Um, so it's something that we talked about just in the sense of would it confuse our students in that process when we have to report, when they have to report what their course levels were? Um, will it change our transcripts? Would it confuse a college to see something like that? So it's not necessarily a, a major change, but when you're looking at what the colleges use now, mm -hmm. um, college prep is generally the most widely used. And then, like Mr. Jenner said, potentially removing the label completely would be probably the next most common Sure. Option. So I think that's a long way to say, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but I think to make a change that's <laughs> there, not like things going on. that's not messaged fully would run the risk of being confusing and almost sure. like uh, run the risk of like moving away from college prep, which is changing the tag certainly wouldn't be. But I wouldn't yeah. want it to be misunderstood. So I think that's on our still on the table for future edits, um, and, and we'll try to make sure we get it just right. Okay, no, that, that makes total sense, and things have obviously changed since I applied for college many years ago, so that's good. And then uh, just w one last question was, uh, you know, first time for me really seeing the whole high school breadth of offerings, and it's really comprehensive, a lot more electives and everything than where I went to high school, so mm -hmm. which, which is great. Um, so just wondering, thinking ahead, you know, kind of blue sky, uh, what other courses and programs would you all like to add? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a question that was most recently asked in 2021. Um, so there was a program review that occurred um, as part of the NIAS visit to look at our program of studies and the surrounding communities to see what the similarities are or what the differences are, like what we're missing that other communities are missing. I think one example that's timely to highlight is computer science. So we were lacking uh, competitive computer science uh, courses that were available elsewhere. As a result of that 2021 program review, computer science courses went in, both at the CP level, also at the AP level. Uh, and last week, uh, the school got recognized for the Female Diversity Award for having over 50% of the AP computer science enrollment reflecting um, you know, female students. So uh, what my point is, is I think in 2021, we really did a deep inventory of what we need for courses. And still in this program of studies, we're trying to carry out that 21, 2021 review. So I think once we get all those things kind of in, we'll be in a great position to look at it again. Um, you know, teachers are excited. You know, we had a great conversation uh, with one staff member who's really passionate about a journalism course, wants to implement the course, wants to see that turn into a school paper or a school newscast. So there's passion there. It's almost like we just need to kind of finish one menu of things first and yep. then execute the next. One of the things that I'm excited about uh, in doing so is we have a number of courses in the program of studies that haven't run in five or more years. And so uh, every year those pick up stray requests that we don't have enough to run, but that makes the tallies for our other courses inaccurate. Um, so I think um, once we kind of finish this phase of the program of studies, open um, the door to new ideas, we can also kind of clean up some of um, the underutilized courses uh, to really maximize the effectiveness or the efficiency of the program of studies. No. Um, so I, I would hesitate to list things because I sure. want to make sure the staff That's fine. have the chance No, it makes to... sense. You're, you're still getting through the process, and mm -hmm. then you'll yep. be ready there soon. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then just one final thing is I'd like to see the biotechnology course. I work in biotech, so um, yeah. it was good that it's here. So yeah, if you great. need any assistance, <laughs> feel free to reach out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. We'll make that connection No problem. Happen. Thank you. Mr. Turner. So two things. First of all, um, thank you for all the updates and, and all the, the edits. Um, the, uh, every time I look at this thing, I wish I could go back to high school and just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we had a good selection of courses when I was there, but it's, it's nothing compared to this. One thing I did look at, though, is, is with the, the expectation chart, it kind of highlighted when I thought about the 8.0 mm -hmm. and thought about what the numbers were. And if I took like a sample child, mm -hmm. two AP classes, three honors, no, yeah, three honors and three CP level, and mm -hmm. added those up at the high and the low end. Mm -hmm. You get to five hours and 45 minutes of homework at the high end, and three hours and 45 minutes at the low end. That's a, when I think about it in those terms, that's a lot of homework a night. Mm -hmm. um, bordering on six hours if you add one more AP class then. And so is that, in the, in the review of 33 other school districts, and the review of expectations, is four to six hours of homework a night especially if you've got a sport or a band or a extracurricular activity, karate or whatever, is that, are we in the right place with that? So I, I would, um, I think, look at those calculations together. Yeah. Um, you know, a number of those courses are bound to be elective classes and in um, this move, all the electives are college prep level and there's a specification in the honors, uh, excuse me, in the college prep homework that elective courses may have less or no homework. So those courses could come off the table yeah. uh, to begin with. Our recommendation is no more than four AP classes, which should balance out to two per day. But if you're getting two hours of homework for your two AP classes, like, uh, and we're trying to resemble a college environment, then that's a lot, um, but it's for a student who has you know, voluntarily asked for the college level experience. Um, so I don't think we're going to see instances where we're approaching four to six hours of homework per night. So clarification then, I, I was, it says per class per night, and I was thinking five days of class, class homework. Even if you're not in the class, how much oh, okay. are you expecting homework? An hour tonight, gotcha. an hour tomorrow night for an AP class, or are you expecting the hour that day effectively? I mean, obviously yeah. it would average out, but yeah. so I may have doubled it, and so maybe the language there might be sure. you know, per class, not per class per night, because then yeah. it, becomes five days of AP homework I a see week what you as mean. opposed to 
So I may have mis misread it, or maybe okay. that's an opportunity for clarification. Yeah, we can definitely clarify that, because okay. that's saying, like, on that school day, you'd receive assignments that would be due, not the next day, the following day, yep. uh, theoretically following 248 minutes of W-2 plus, yep. plus homework time. So we can help um, kind of spell that out. And I think certainly, you know, if this program of studies and all this is approved, uh, through the school counseling seminars, we have regular meetings with all of the students to really walk them through building the schedule, understanding the expectations chart. So, um, you know, it's new to everyone. This is kind of the first real read of it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's helpful feedback okay. in helping us kind of communicate it more clearly. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Penland. Thank you. Uh, continuing sort of on that expectations chart, which I love, I think it's, it's fantastic. Is there uh, thought or interest in putting it elsewhere in you know, the, the handbook or something? I think I, I'm thinking it's good information for the students, but also for the families. Like if, you know, when my kid gets to high school, I would like to know what he <laughs> should be expecting as well, right? Because yeah. he's not going to give me that information. But, yeah. So I, I think this is great, and I would like, uh, I was just curious if you guys had given any thought to using it and elsewhere. Yeah, I think you'll see it everywhere. Dr. Quirk has asked about using it with the eighth grade teams and making sure. recommendations for the high school. Um, <coughs> the department uh, leaders asked us if they could use it today during CIT day for the curriculum map. So, uh, you know, absolutely, to your point, I think it's going to be all over the place. Uh, and, and I think that's why we made it, right? Like the feedback from students and families and teachers was we need more concrete clarity about, you know, what we're looking for. And um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's some tweaks to make and we'll make it better, but that it's landing kind of in that ballpark. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Continuing that, th that theme, um, the, I think this idea of consistency across, like greater consistency across the school and across teachers and so forth, I think that's really important and I'm, I'm so thrilled to see um, that so much thinking is going into that. Um, and following on what Mr. Turner said that, you know, the idea even just that, that all teachers have a common understanding that, because I think that that's not always the case, that, you know, when you have courses that don't meet every day, then one teacher may have an expectation of, well, you know, you're going to do homework the night before you have my course. Mm -hmm. And another teacher might have an expectation, well, you have two days to get this homework done mm -hmm. until we meet again. And so I'm assigning homework, but I expect that you have two days. And that, uh, making sure that there are common understandings mm -hmm. of how much time do you expect, you know, do you expect to students to have two days and therefore assign, you know, a reasonable amount of two days worth of homework, but maybe another teacher is not thinking the same way. And making sure that everyone's on the same page uh, in, the, in that respect and, and others, I think, is, uh, is important. And it, I mean, but it really sounds like you have your, your eye on the ball on that area. I think so. And just to connect back to Mrs. Maha's comment is, like, if we also have the collaboration time for teachers to be talking about this as it's going, like, I, I think it's really going to be transformative mm -hmm. um, kind of in the teacher experience, but then certainly in how the kid experienced the course. Yeah, common planning time. That's going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to do that for real yeah. um, at the school. Other questions or comments? Thank you for your thank time. You all. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Yeah, yes. thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Roll cats. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> you want to steal your thunder. Uh, oh, that would be inconceivable. Have you planning to bring the... Bring it still the haunts it, that idea. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> February 14th. Yep. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just to, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Gendron. Uh, Mr. Miranda. You guys, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we, we have this here. It is uh, typically the case that this is a first read, the program of studies, just to be clear and specifically. Um, but uh, we'll have it back for, thank you, for uh, uh, your hopeful approval at the next meeting, uh, February 14th. Um, I, I know we, we approve the program of studies. Do we, we don't also need to approve the schedule. That's just, that's more informational. That's informational. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just clarifying. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, next item under new business tonight is the uh, recommended budget for fiscal year 25. There is a, an item to accompany this uh, in your packet. Um, and uh, we'll uh, try and go through this um, rather, uh, rather quickly. Uh, so again, just for members, maybe more of the community who are, are tuning in, we do go through uh, as a presentation, the administration's presentation to the school committee, a number of, a number of different budgetary presentations. This is as this is par for the course. Uh, we start typically in December, which we did back in uh, December with what we term a preliminary budget. 
just to put a frame around that, the preliminary budget is uh, what we believe to be, reason based upon the information we have before us, reasonable estimates to bring forward uh, and package together as a budget. Um, that moves on to this place that we are this evening, and that is the recommended budget. And so call it roughly six weeks um, or so since work went to uh, pull together the preliminary budget information, uh, two things have really happened. Uh, one, uh, we have um, been able to hone in more specifically on um, uh, what we believe our projections are in enrollment, particularly around some of our more uh, for special education programming. Um, just but other six weeks passes, it's a lot of time to, to gather more of a, a, a honed, um, sort of honed in focus on what we believe our needs are fiscally for the following school year. And the other, um, the other piece of information that emerges, um, as is typically the case, is a better understanding from the town uh, in terms of what uh, is believed to be possible to support department budgets. Just as a reminder, we are one department, albeit the largest in the town, uh, but we are one department of many, um, police, fire, and of course many others. Tonight, um, our effort is to try and bring all of this information together and to provide you with an update on from where we left off now to where we are this evening. Um, as we'll talk about at the end, this will take us into our next budget presentation um, that's planned for February. Um, this slide provides you with an overview of what has um, taken place more specifically, again, since the December 20th meeting, which is when we pro uh, provided you with a preliminary budget. Um, our leadership team, um, Ms. Elliott, Mr. Ruggiero, and myself met with um, uh, uh, in the interim town manager on January 2nd, at the very beginning of the new year, uh, to review the district's preliminary budget. That is a process that certainly during my time, and I know well before it, um, has been what uh, transpires. Um, and that is uh, to have that meeting and to be able to walk through the town manager with what the, uh, the fiscal resource needs are of the district going forward. We shared with the interim town manager that our budgetary uh, roll up at that point in time was 4.34%, um, or uh, you can see a little bit more than $2 million increase um, from current fiscal year 24 to 25. Um, during the course of that meeting, um, uh, the interim town manager had uh, asked if we as a department could uh, adjust that budgetary increase overall and try and align with that with a 3.75% increase. Uh, 3.75 in comparison to 4.34% increase is an adjusted uh, uh, reduction necessary of just a little bit over $280,000 as you can see in that third bullet. Again, that's, uh, this is, um, has been somewhat far for the course in terms of these conversations and a better understanding around where, uh, at least through the eyes of the town manager, um, the, the budgetary resources lie for, uh, for the town. Um, our team, in turn, as we uh, in such circumstances uh, do, uh, we circle back together, uh, pri primarily the central office leadership team, to take a look at more uh, specifically two areas of our operations that um, we thought we could make adjustments to to align with that budgetary request from the interim town manager, and they're highlighted here. Uh, the increased uh, use of circuit breaker funding um, as well as additional salary savings. I should note the presentation is not going to go deeper into these, but obviously if you have questions, we can, we can tackle those at the end. Um, I think the really important piece to point out, though, is that last point on this slide, and that, yes, um, as, a, as, as a number, uh, it's understood that a little over 280,000 uh, may seem like, and it is, a large number. Um, that said, uh, we believe that we can make these adjustments, align with the town request, and not adversely impact our staffing that we presented as part of this overall budgetary increase for fiscal year 25, uh, the budget plan. Said another way, we believe that even with this adjustment, we can open our doors in the fall uh, with the appropriate level of resources and staffing to support the needs of the district based upon all of the information that we have as we stand here uh, before you today. Um, in addition to that at, that, uh, at that meeting, the town, also the interim town manager, a well, temporary, sorry, town manager, also had requested if the district could consider uh, making a, an adjustment to the capital requests. You know that that's another important and, and rather large number for the town every year. Again, not just based upon the school district's request, but all town departments. Um, you recall, and included in here later in the slides is an overview of the many capital request items that we present, presented to you previously. Uh, we in turn came back and we talked as a central office leadership team 
And um, honestly, in this particular case, they really all, they are all connected to technology. And so with Mr. Lord's, um, uh, Mr. Lord's uh, view of things, he felt comfortable that we could push ahead for a year. So moving out to fiscal year 26, three particular items, and you can see these highlighted there. The elementary projector replacements, the security camera improvements, and the auditorium sound system at the middle school. Um, just to be clear, this is not a removal of these items from the list. It wasn't a wish list and we've been you know, asked to reduce and so we've taken them off the list. Rather, it's a view of, uh, we, can, we believe under Mr. Lord's leadership we can get another year out of these uh, respective items, but due diligence would push us in a path towards they need to be replaced. Uh, the plan would be to push those off to fiscal year 26. Um, and you can see the respective amounts for those capital items. Uh, in terms of the personnel, um, and, and this is a budgetary, uh, a budget plan uh, to support our contractual and service delivery obligations. You can see, again, as a, as a point of, of reminder, largely a people business, we know this, we talk about this an awful lot, uh, not just uh, the Wilmington Public Schools, but um, any school district around, uh, this, this work and these, these numbers go largely to support the personnel that we have. And that, as you know, rolls up to be just, just shy of 500 full-time equivalent staff members. Um, the fiscal year 25 recommended budget uh, relative to personnel goes to support, support the negotiated contracts for all of our bargaining units. That puts us in a good place. Uh, just as a reminder, going into fiscal year 25, currently all of our contracts uh, are settled. Um, that will be a different conversation next year, but that's a year from now. The total increase to the budget that directly goes towards supporting all of our employee groups that we hold oversight for or responsibility fiscally for, you can see that rolls up in terms of steps and lanes, uh, a little over $900,000. Uh, salary increases, a little over a million dollars and longevity, uh, a little over $11,000. So you have to think about this and members of our community and, and state that taking our existing full-time equivalent staff members and rolling them into next year uh, these are the dollar figures that are built into contract uh, increases, contractual increases that the school committee has uh, respectively with um, these various um, employee groups. Uh, we have since the last time, um, or not since the last time, through this planning, I'm sorry, also identified as we always try and do adjustments that we think we can make in staffing. Things change from year to year um, in, in a number of different areas. That could be enrollment driven, that could be special education program driven, or everything in between. Um, and you can see the highlights there that the salary replacements and reductions um, at just 4.80 uh, FTE equivalent. We've also though, through our, our uh, due diligence and planning, um, added 3.60 FTEs. We've identified the need to do that in order to meet a variety of legal and contractual requirements. Particularly, and you'll recall we, we focused a little bit more on this last time in December around English language learning uh, and the, uh, the respective need that we've identified to expand the staffing in those areas. The overall personnel, as mentioned in the fiscal year 25 plan, is um, 488.15 FTEs. That's a slight reduction uh, of 1.2 from this fiscal year. Um, as you'll recall, relatively speaking, our enrollment, I, I would describe as flat. Um, uh, overall uh, going forward in the next year based upon based upon the information that we have. Um, this is a, a view, you saw this slide uh, last time during the presentation, but um, uh, I think it um, again is a nice visual overall of what our staffing, those 488 plus FTEs look like. We've made the respective adjustments, what Paul has here. Um, so they're slightly adjusted in some areas since the December version. But again, you can see as an organization, obviously, uh, the largest groups are our general education teachers, uh, our ed assistants and special education teachers followed by the others there um, that go towards contributing to the programs and services each and every day to operate our school system. So um, at, at a high level, uh, the um, slides that follow, um, they reflect sort of the, the, the view that you typically see from, um, from, from Mr. Ruggiero in his office, they've been adjusted accordingly uh, with some of the changes that I mentioned a few moments ago. This slide shows the personnel changes uh, for fiscal year 24 in comparison to this plan that's being proposed for your consideration for fiscal year 25. Um, and you can see a lot of numbers there, but you can see the adjustments from uh, one fiscal year to the next. Uh, with those personnel changes comes, of course, the salary changes. 
um, and the careful tracking of that. I, I highlighted earlier the steps and lanes and so on, the other uh, things that make up this. Uh, again, there's a lot of things that our, our, uh, our <coughs> finance department tracks carefully. Um, collectively, uh, the fiscal year 25 recommended budget, uh, just a little bit over $39 million. The percentage change from this year to next is 4.24%. Non-salary <coughs> changes that we talked previously about, um, there are an awful lot of these that also as a school district we have uh, an obligation to attend to. Um, go into detail of those, but certainly transportation, textbooks, the work of the, 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 the work of education in terms of curriculum supplies, professional development, and so on, um, and these are captured here. Overall, uh, the non-salary items rolled up uh, just a little bit over $10 million to operate the Wilmington Public Schools is what we are anticipating and planning for for next year as a percentage change, 1.93%. So when you roll all that together, the recommended budget looks like this. And you can see on this slide is comparative. Um, again, breaking down as you've seen before, the salary and non-salary items. You can see in a comparison, in a comparative sense, fiscal year 24 budget. <coughs> what that looked like from the uh, preliminary budget when we were before you in December. What it looks like now as part of the recommended budget and then those, uh, those changes. The bottom line. Uh, we, we, we believe that we can uh, make this adjust, adjustment as requested, and again, a 3.75% increase. This, a um, lot of numbers, a lot of things here, but this is just an updated overview of the capital items for fiscal year 25. You'll note we took those three items that was on the earlier slide um, that was shared with you, and those have been adjusted into fiscal year 26. Um, and as is always the case, capital is we try to be um, thoughtful around a five-year out look, look out window. Uh, and so these uh, are, are highlighted there. Um, so as a summary of where we, we stand right now, again, as I, I think uh, it's important to, mess, um, to um, make it clear and message that uh, this budget plan supports the necessary staffing that based upon what we have in terms of information and knowing students right now uh, to deliver the programs necessary for our enrollment predictions for fiscal year 25. Um, it in also addresses and shores up additional support for um, some of our uh, more intensive needs students, um, and that includes, of course, special education as well as EL, uh, the EL student population, and I think that's just important to note. Next steps in the process, uh, January 29th, um, obviously uh, not a presentation for this group, but for the at the town manager level, uh, that town manager's budget presentation is being made on Monday of next week. Um, as you are aware, we have a budget hearing uh, that we have to do annually. Uh, all school, uh, all public school districts do uh, need to comply with that uh, formal public hearing. We have that scheduled. This is typically the case in February, and that, that is scheduled for your February 14th meeting uh, here in this room. Uh, February 29th, we have our scheduled meeting as a department with the Finance Committee, uh, and then May 4th, the Wilmington uh, Annual Town Meeting. So this is an update uh, this evening. Um, we are not looking for your vote of approval tonight. That comes with the, um, the budget hearing, though, in, on February 14th. And with all of that, uh, happy to take any questions that members of the committee have. We do okay. Mr. Samaha. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Uh, thank you for this, of course. Um, I'm curious, has there been any communications with the Finance Committee regarding any of this uh, so far? Is there any? Um, updates on that you, you might provide us because I know you know in years past sometimes it's not always been smooth uh, I, I mean I'm happy to speak to it or, or we have uh, members of uh, the school committee then the uh, budget subcommittee um, Sure. so we have reached out to them um, and we were not able to organize a meeting to preview this um, they're aware I mean they're certainly aware that we spoke about it on the 20th at our meeting here they're aware that it's on our agenda tonight and that it'll be on the 14th um, and then and then part of our, our outreach in terms of having a meeting was some conversations among our group as to how we might best present some of this information and it led to some of the changes as well in terms of presentation here and so I, I believe we are in a, a good place to present to them but um, just from a timing and organization perspective amongst the, the two groups of volunteers, we did not organize the meeting that we hoped to this year. Okay. We will try earlier next year with that process for sure. Okay, thank you. Is that, okay. Yep. Ms. Burtz? 
Um, I just had a, a quick, I think I, I just, it's more of a question, but I just need a, it's a clarifying question. Um, I know in part of the reductions, it, um, you note to, um, to increase use of CB fund, circuit breaker funding. Um, and then I looked at what the circuit breaker funding was, is I guess being proposed for fiscal year 25 as um, just under 70,000, right? Increase to that. So, oh, so an increase to the offset. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's All a right. change to the offset. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That clarifies it for me then. Appreciate it. Mr. Turner. So um, thank you again for all the details and all the effort in, in revising this and being able to meet the request from the town manager. I really appreciate that. Um, a couple quick points I wanted to make. One, I, I really want to say how much I appreciate the revision you made to the chart of staff to highlight the, w the work that the educational assistants do and that, that a large part of them, 71 out of the 89, are focused on special education. And, and then adding in the special education teachers, there's a huge component of what we provide is, is what is appropriate things for the students to meet their needs. And so I think it's really important to see that piece. Um, and it, it goes to the level of service that can be required. The addition that's required for staffing is a one-to-one -one educational assistance. So that's the right, that's what's needed for the students. And it's a very important thing for people to, to, to understand about our budget and, and our entire need to meet the students' needs is there are some students that have a very wide range of needs and the staffing required to accommodate those is is it can be very intense sometimes. Um, and the other piece, the last piece that you mentioned, I believe in our last presentation, it, this is a level service budget. Yes. Um, fundamentally, yes. we are, and, and to, to one of the questions you had, Mr. Mercaldi, the other time, Dr. Mercaldi, the other time, this is not driving new program, new growth. This is to maintain where we are. Um, and so I, I think it's important to highlight that point. Where we are is a, is a Good district that does a lot of very good things, but this is not a not does not represent growth. It represents maintaining where we are. So, thank you very much for all your efforts on this. Paul, I please. appreciate those comments, and I will say that um, I started to think about um, uh, the the point made earlier, the question around sort of where you know has the there been the opportunity to bring the finance committee up to speed with this, and um, I will say that um, it's my thought that the uh, the presentation that is put together for your budget hearing. Uh, might be a look, might have a little bit of a different look in the previous times um, and go uh, sort of that place of expanding upon the staffing adjustments that have happened over time. Mm -hmm. It's about the educational assistance, but it also it also very clearly highlights as a district um, the reductions that we have made as a district in certain areas, specifically general education teachers over the last decade plus. Um, as an effort to try and respond to the adjustments to and the downward trend of the enrollment. At the same time, it very clearly shows the increase in our special education staffing, our educational assistance, and some of the other, um, for example, guidance and psychologists. Uh, and, um, and, and we talked at length about that, but I think, it's, uh, I think it continues to be important to try to uh, clearly convey that to the members of our community, not just about our finance committee, but our community at large, that. Uh, despite the fact that our enrollment, like other districts, may be declining, uh, student needs are going very much in the opposite direction. And we also continue to believe as a district that where and when we can provide those services for students who might need more intensive services in our school district, that is better for the child, that is better for their family, and that is better for our community. Uh, but that does come with oftentimes a cost. One last point, just because you just raised that point. I do think one of the things that's very important also for the community knowledge is it appears, based on where we are and where Paul rolls the numbers forwards on enrollment, that we may have reached the low point of our enrollment. It, is, it, it appears that in the coming years, and particularly if we maintain something in the range of 70% coming from the middle school to the high school for freshman year, that we will actually start to turn the corner on enrollment and be growing slightly. So the trend has certainly been down over the last decade plus, but we may not be in that trend anymore. And it's very likely the way it looks right now is that we may start heading up and, and be having different conversations about enrollment. And I think that's an important picture to, to important piece of the picture. I, I, and, and I think, um, I, I think so. And, and I also think that, um, 
And we actually gathered some data that I'll, I'll use as part of the next presentation in terms of where as a community we stand uh, over the last few years in, relate, in, re, in regards to enrollment uh, trends um, and uh, in, in comparison to other communities. But, but also the high school, you know, obviously that's been, been a, a large focal point of our conversation here. Um, it is impossible to uh, divorce the reality of the overall population of our district has declined over the last 10 years. Uh, obviously there too is, is the enrollment of the high school. At the same time, the retention rate from eighth to ninth grade, um, and as well, the students that seems very clearly, and the numbers, Mr. Jenner could speak to this, I can't sit here and tell you we've had more than the normal year of students returning uh, in ninth grade um, who left, who made the decision to leave at the end of eighth grade and have decided to come back. Um, I, I, I'll gather that those numbers definitively, but um, I think the answer to that is yes, and there have and there continues to be, and you heard him hint about this, I think, tonight, uh, about students who are continuing to come back to Wilmington High School. Um, I think it's probably no surprise that, you know, to anyone that as our program of studies continues to expand and to bolster, you know, our enrollment, um, or sorry, our participation in athletics, even though the enrollment is, is up. I mean, things are, are trending in a very positive direction that I think uh, very clearly for some of our students who might be in the middle school now and their families thinking about alternatives, uh, I think uh, I think very much that there's going to be thoughtful discussion and conversation around, boy, Wilmington High School can provide a very, very comprehensive uh, and great educational experience for the high school, and I think we'll see that correlate with our retention rate. Mr. Penley. Thank you. Yeah, just a curiosity question, because I can't recall 3.75 increase this year. What was it last year? Oh, I think it was 3.75. It was about the same, right? About the same, correct, yes. Thanks, Paul. Yes. That's it. Oh. It's 3.75. Hmm. So. Ms. Burns. Thank you. So I know that the, with regards to the contractual piece, um, so what about the, um, and I know that this budget is reflective of just um, the cost of sustaining the programs that we have. Um, and I know even within that, that we have been able to drive and, and expand on certain items, not the big ticket items, but um, I, I guess, and I know you plan accordingly, I, I, and Paul, thank you for keeping us in the black for decades, which is, which is an unusual um, feat in any school district um, in this day and age. But I wonder how, with the needs, I mean, there's so many facets. I, I think with each passing year, the resources that the um, schools are providing for not only our students, but for their families and the rest of the community increase. Um, I just don't want, and I think Mr. Gendron was a great example of um, innovative and creative program of studies as a piece, but we will need to look, to look forward to um, as society and careers change and evolve, um, there will be a, another level of technology and as uh, Dr. McCauldy did speak to about in things such as biotech and <coughs> biomedical um, fields, um, whether it be technology, whether it be labs, whether it be other resources, we wanna make sure because I think this high school schedule is a first strong indicator. We need to continue growing our schools, not only uh, our programming and our um, uh, the resources and the opportunities for students, not just at the middle school, uh, high school level, but at the middle school. And that's going to take education does come at a cost, and we we just can't. I don't want to say status quo because that's not really relevant, but after decades and decades of unfunded and underfunded mandates, um, which we will, we will uh, come across in the future, we, we can't just sustain to sustain. Um, and public education and education in general is an investment in our government and in our future. Um, and I just, I just caution and I just worry that, yes, you know, I know we do need to be fiscally responsible uh, for the for not for the only the benefit and the and the viability of our school district, but for our community of which we serve. But um, we we do, do will need to maybe um, start planning 
in a forecasting like way about how do we start chipping away at these things that our students um, will need to know and, and open up those doors of opportunity for them to start here. Um, I, I just, I, I may not be articulating it as well as I'd like to, but um, I just caution on, um, I, I caution that at, at some point it'll come to bite us, and you know, bite us. All this hard and, and great work that's being done that it, it, it could um, work to our detriment um, as to what that could look like, I, I can't say, but I just, we just can't, um, I say this cautiously and respectfully, we, we, we just can't maintain um, a status quo for, sustain for the long-term sustainability of it, um, public education in our community. I, I guess that probably is the only way I can say it um, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a couple, a few questions and comments. Um, so the, the short, <clears throat> shortfall, so to speak, between the preliminary budget and, and the recommended budget today, um, so the previous, one of the first slides talked about essentially being made up in two places, the circuit breaker um, offset and salary reductions. Um, can you give some more detail on that? Um, I know circuit breaker is a little bit weird, but if you can explain sort of what the circuit breaker program does and how we're able to cover some of that um, budget decrease with the circuit um, breaker. That way, yeah with circuit sure. breaker so the circuit breaker is a funding mechanism that school districts receive a uh, reimbursement or funds to cover a certain percentage of special ed tuitions and transportations uh, in transportation so at the end of each fiscal year a student support services have has to build a, a, a large database and submit it to DESE um, that outlines all the costs by student for special ed tuitions and transportation costs. Uh, that goes through an audit process with DESE. And once that's approved, um, they take that whole dollar amount of expenses the district incurred and it's offset by a, it used to be four times the foundation budget. It's changed a little bit, but there's a dollar amount. <coughs> Say it's $40,000, I'm making this up. So if you paid, if it costs you $100,000 to um, send a student out of district with transportation, you could get reimbursed the difference between the 100,000 and you subtract that 40,000. So that's 60,000 that's left. DESE then, as part of the, 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 the state budget and so forth, can reimburse up to 75% of that cost. So that, that's an amount of money that school districts get quarterly during a school year. Um, so in our budgeting process, we show gross um, special ed tuitions, but then you notice there's a, a, a special ed tuition offset. offset, circuit breaker offset it's called. It's a negative number in the budget. That reflects some of those funds that are coming from the state. And what we did this year is the difference between what we received in fiscal year 23 and what we are receiving for circuit breaker reimbursements from the state in fiscal um, 24 is about $175,000 difference, an in increase. So we took not quite half, but about 70,000 of that and used that to increase our circuit breaker offset in the budget just to, to close the gap to get us to, to the 3.75. If I could just mention the salary changes, many of them were due the timing of the budget we get people retire and they get us information at the very beginning of December or very end of November. From a timing perspective, I don't usually have time to get them in the preliminary budget that she had with you in the, the middle of or later in December. So a lot of the savings that we have seen is related to people who are retiring. We also, during the, the course of, um, from you know, really middle of November to now, we had some open positions, we had replacements that were hired that might have been lower or higher salary than what was being carried in the preliminary budget. And we may have also had uh, someone that resigned, so we put in like a, a placeholder for that position. So that, for the majority of the, the savings from a salary perspective was related to that retirement so the cost savings so if you have someone that's making a hundred thousand dollars you assume the replacement might be eighty thousand so there's twenty thousand dollar savings 
Uh, so that's kind of how we, we do that. And we've done that so every year. People with like more longevity and who are higher, exactly, yeah, higher in the yeah. steps and lanes. Exactly, yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. come in. And this, so this is basically the idea of un, sort of unknown or at least not quite anticipated information from the preliminary Correct. budget. Correct, yeah. You know, at, the, at the time, you can't assume people are just going to retire no. right. <laughs> <laughs> to replace them. Um, uh, okay, and the and then the circuit break also adds for out of district out of district placements. Yeah. To be clear, that that's a that, it, it, that aspect of yeah. It's also I think if if students in district get a certain amount of services, there's a whole process. I think the uh, special ed department has to go through to you know if the services that student that's in district is receiving goes over that threshold. I think is a piece there that they can claim as well. But this is primarily, primarily. About, out, out yep. about the cost of out of out of district tuitions Correct. and transportation. And yep. remember, we had that whole huge increase um, yep. in the tuition prices that right. the, yep. um, the, the placements could charge. Um, great, thank you, thank you uh, for that explanation. Um, Comment-wise, I want to briefly echo um, Mr. Turner's comment about um, breaking how breaking the ed assistance into how many support special education versus regular education. Um, because when you look at that, you actually see that we have more ed assistants, basically one more, but <laughs> more ed assistants serving special education than full teachers. Uh, and that when you add them both together, and of course then you actually add in the additional support staff and student services and psychologists and counselors and BCBAs and on, that more than 30% of our FTE headcount is supporting special education directly um, you know, in, the, in the classrooms and with these additional services. And, uh, and that that's, you know, if, it's like if you don't understand that, um, that the, the percentage of people that it takes to service our special education is much higher as a percentage than the percentage of the student body that are receiving special education services. It's like you need to understand that to understand um, the school budget. Um, my last comment is about um, the capital deferrals um, for the capital expenses and um, I understand why, why we're doing it, and, uh, and I certainly think that if we can you know, put off expenditures because the equipment we have now is going to last for another year, then okay, because we shouldn't be spending money that we don't need to spend. Um, we should be getting the most out of our you know, equipment uh, as much as we can. But I do have a little bit of unease of pushing too much down the line because when you look at that slide for the projected five-year capital expenses, mm -hmm. next year is a doozy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because you take those three big items next two and push them into, uh, yeah, I mean, the next two years. But, you know, next year, you know, you take those big items and now we're looking at, you know, $888,000 of projected capital expenses next year. And if we go to that, you know, go to the town manager next year with this proposal, you know, Yep. Very likely to say, hmm, that's a lot of capital expenses there. Can we push something off to the following year? Right. And maybe we can. So I don't want to basically say just like, no, we have to draw a line in the sand. But I think we do have to be a little bit careful because, you know, you keep pushing off and you push off and push off and you kick things down the can and then you start getting equipment failure. Mm -hmm. and, Issues, yeah. and and it's, it's something that I just want us to be a little bit careful about. Um, going forward with uh, with the capital requests. So I, I, we agree with you completely. Um, when we moved the um, items that we moved, we had discussion with, as, as uh, the superintendent mentioned, with a director of technology. Um, and he was very comfortable with moving those particular items. What's left in the budget are really critical in the FY25. They really need to be replaced or, or replaced in FY25. He's also in the process of creating a new tech plan. Mm -hmm. And as the tech plan evolves, some of these things might move out again. Some other things might move in. Mm -hmm. So as he's going through that, um, there might be adjustments when we do this next year for 26 to 30, FY30. So, um, but we're really cognizant of, you know, can we get by with something for another year or two or we need to replace it next year. And, and that's what we have in FY25. Our items in his estimation really need to be replaced in FY25. And I'll add the other thing, of course, we I think I mentioned before that could impact this is what the, by this point in time, we'll know what the new school building, um, Wildwood School building will consist of. 
um, and that could very easily impact the, this capital list, uh, mm -hmm. depending on once there's a clear view of what that building will okay. consist of, the grade levels, schools combined, uh, and so on. So, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a. I'm glad you brought up that the, we're developing the new tech, you know, technology plan because we may go in a different direction on certain um, things for some of these some of these kind of expenses and technology. That also kind of gets a little bit back to Mers Burns' point about looking forward and thinking about what's coming mm -hmm. and, uh, and budget for the future. <coughs> All right. Any further questions or comments? All right, then we look forward to uh, you. seeing this Thank you. Uh, again Thank you. for the budget yep. hearing on February 14th. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Want me to jump to the calendar? Yeah. So, uh, budget. All right, so now we're going to return to uh, the calendar. Dr. Okay. Rand. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it is, um, there, there is information to accompany this item also <laughs> in the packet. Uh, not uh, at all unusual at this time of the year to start to get uh, a sense of the school committee around what the following school year calendar will will be. As you know, this is um, uh, one of the decision items that uh, you have authority over. Um, there's a memo that accompanies two different versions or two different looks of the calendar, not with a lot of differences, but some. Uh, but there are some things that I think really this year uh, are a little bit uh, a little bit different uh, for you as a committee to consider going into next year. I tried to point these out um, in the memo. Um, just as a, some context setting, as a reminder, um, within the contract, uh, the Friday before Labor Day weekend uh, is a uh, is to be a non-school day, and so um, consistent with that and the contract language, uh, both versions here uh, again include what will be Friday, August the 30th as a non-school day, uh, right before the Labor Day uh, weekend. Um, there are some uh, developments, though, relative to uh, voting and the Town Hall School Administration building. I tried to outline these in the memo, but well, let me take a pass at trying to describe this for the listener who hasn't, um, or the, the viewer. Um, so we, we know that there's a uh, important building project that will uh, be breaking ground in March, uh, right, this, this March. Yes. Uh, the Town Hall School Administration Building. Uh, that building will be, uh, as many know, uh, built uh, across the street from the Roman House and uh, is set to break ground, as I said, in March of 2024 and open in the summer of 2025. But the, the relevance of that project uh, is on uh, parking. And um, well, there's a couple of points of relevance. One is on uh, the impact on student parking lot, Swain Parking over there. But the secondary impact um, has to do uh, with, with the closure of the Wildwood. And that was, as, as many know, uh, that was one of a few voting locations uh, in the town of Wilmington. The other is the Betwell, and as I have come to learn, the other is the Town Hall. With the Wildwood completely closed now and offline, uh, that, uh, that removed the, uh, the thought to use that facility any longer. The cut of utilities and, sever and so on just made that um, not an option. Um, the town is, uh, as we understand it, is uh, fully anticipating to have voting precincts move into the new town hall school administration building once that building opens. There's actually a large, for some of you who are familiar with the project, it's actually a very large room or rooms in the lower level, um, and that's the plan. I'm not sure how many precincts are planned to be moved in there, but I think many, if not all, uh, is the thought. But I'm, I'm I don't, please don't quote me on the that. New, the new, new town, town hall. hall. I, my yeah. understanding, I, if I recall the f most recent conversation, I think it's all six all. precincts yeah. was the idea. Um, so there, uh, th this, there's all an intersection, stay with me with the calendar here, uh, where this is going. And so um, the town uh, approached us last year, uh, I think originally at the end of the school year, to say, look, um, we're in this, they're in this sort of um, uh, challenging period of time uh, with the Wildwood closed and until the new town hall school administration building can open, um, could they uh, and the town in turn use the high school as a voting precinct? Um, uh, that's not currently the case. Uh, we had some, we've had a number of discussions about this and um, as I've shared with you previously, uh, I know that many schools around do operate and uh, well, well, well school is in session and voting takes place. Um, I think that with appropriate provisions and planning, we can accommodate that, um, especially for the elections that tend not to have uh, as large of a turnout. Next year's a little bit different though um, with the presidential election as you know uh, in November, November 5th. 
So all of that together, we've had to think a little bit more differently about the calendar for next year, and we've tried to map that accordingly. Um, so this is an interim period, right, right next year. Um, the, uh, the voting, therefore, has a different point of relevance here uh, for the calendar. And as you'll note in here, I think the biggest one to point out is that um, with the granting of permission for the town to use the high school as a voting location, and with their understanding of concern of making sure that there's no um, access issues for voters in town, and that has to do with the parking lot, and that has to do with our staff, and where are they gonna park, and back to the town old school administration building and a limitation on parking across the street. There's a whole lot of moving parts happening, and so it's with all of that um, that, um, although uh, a little bit unconventional, the recommendation for your consideration here is to actually close school on the presidential election day uh, next November. Um, it's this sort of one year unique circumstance or situation only and have that as a non-school day. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, as if that's not <laughs> enough to consider, <laughs> the other thing is a winter break. Um, not that this hasn't happened in the past, it certainly has, but um, a little uh, different in that the, the Christmas holiday falls on um, uh, Wednesday, December 25th, I'm just, <laughs> although it's noted 24th, so my apologies on that. Mm. Um, a look back in time um, uh, has seen that when that happens, when Wednesday is the Christmas holiday, uh, the district has closed previously in other years for both Monday, uh, what would be the 23rd, and Tuesday the 24th. So another thing to consider about how we approach that. Um, so with all of that said, we've tried to map out some possibilities here. I know there's a little bit more than usual for you as a school committee to consider. Uh, and we certainly, you know, I think like lots of things, there's some pros and cons to different ways to approach it. Um, but we're happy to try and work this through with you. Um, I think it's important to point out that there's no, there's no need for you to take action to approve anything today. This would be a first read anyway. And based upon all of these possibilities and changes, if you feel as a committee more times needed. Um, there's no policy that you have that states you have to approve the calendar by a certain date. Um, this just seems to be good practice to hit January, February with the time that we can then notify families about what the calendar is going to look like. All right, Ms. Burns. So I'll take a make a preliminary comment that the, um, <clears throat> not that it's really easily identifiable, but. The, the calendar you're proposing where um, taking December 23rd um, mm -hmm. as a, a day off, uh, as a, I think, day. is reasonable because I don't think that there's, even if um, there was any prep or any, the, I don't think we'd get the student uh, population to really um, make it worth, um, well, uh, I was gonna touch upon that, about uh, in staffing as well. I think it would be, um, it would really, um, make things much more complicated and whether or not um, the 23rd could be used as a half day for staff, whether it be for PLC meetings or collaboration, you know, something like that. I, I mean, that's a, an, an, another possibility or spin, um, even if for a half day use, I know that we, we look to see how we can give opportune times. And granted, that's a hairy part of the, the year with a, the holiday, but that's something, um, perhaps um, could be utilized, but it's not, I say that as a um, creative suggestion, doesn't have to be taken seriously. Um, I do think, I think you're right on um, the mark with regards to the presidential election. Um, I think besides parking, I think the traffic, even with a police detail will be horrendous and getting buses in and getting buses out um, would be very complicated by the heavier traffic, especially if the high school um, is going to uh, pick up more than just, is it just the one precinct that would have been in Wildwood? You're just getting two precincts. Two precincts. Two precincts. So, um, so yeah, so three, that. Three and four, I think. Precinct. Okay. So I, I, I would rather err on caution um, so that for safety of students, um, as well as the safety of anybody crossing over um, Middlesex to get into the high school for um, voting, I think, I, I think it would, it makes sense. Um, and we'll pray for no snow days that year, but uh, <laughs> no, yeah, that's, a, that's another. Uh, we, won't, we won't go there, but but I, I just think that the uh, that this particular option um, makes more sense. I um, 
than the uh, the second one. I mean, I've tried to look at the second one in different ways as to where the benefits and the pros could be in that. And I just, but I think just logistically and in common sense, the the one that just says first reading um, is the one I think would would be um, the one I I would go go through unless there was other um, recommendations from the board with regards to what if I can just comment I, I do think you know relative to all of your considerations you know it, it, it student attendance is important and it's not just to get the day done and I think I think so, I know some know my, my feeling of not being a huge fan uh, of early release days um, well professional development is one thing uh, certainly uh, but just early release for early release uh, you know it's still it's one of a few precious days it's not a lot of days we have and uh, even more so though um, I think the consideration of the impact on student attendance and if we believe or know that that could be um, a low student attendance day um, obviously that's that has impact in a multitude of ways learning but but also, you know, if, if uh, on, on our accountability and under the accountability system and where this is going with attendance, I mean, we want to be mindful of that. And I think if you start to sprinkle through a school calendar a variety or a handful of days that may lead just naturally to lower student attendance, I, I think we, as a, as a committee and as an administration, need to think critically about that. So I can see 20, the 23rd, perhaps some might argue, just to come back for one day. Uh, especially for families that may be traveling, um, that probably would yield, I would guess, lower attendance. Well, and I think it would also be, could be a struggle. It doesn't necessarily <coughs> have to be, I don't want to say it a wasted day, but as I said, even if um, staff want to have faculty, certain small faculty meetings via Zoom, for instance, um, or something to that effect, I, I would in encourage it if, if there's a need. I'm, uh, but I'm just thinking that that could be very well um, an oppor opportunity, um, a possible opportunity, not otherwise uh, created. Mr. Turner. So with regard to the 23rd, I, I, I would be curious to know what the staff think about the idea of working that one day and what they would view in terms of the educational value, in terms of the student attendance, in terms of their own attendance. I, my initial reaction is it's, I, I have a hard time seeing that being a day where all those things won't happen, where we won't have low attendance, on the teachers, on the students, on all the staff. Mm -hmm. And so then to that point, I, I really struggle with, with not having it as a day off to begin with. Um, I do also have a very strong opinion on half days other than for professional development or conferences. Um, I, I, they don't seem to sit well. It's either we're in school or we're not. The idea of a half day, we talked about it this prior year with December. And I, I know I heard from several people who thought we should have had a half day on the Friday and told me I was wrong, but um, <laughs> several people. Um, but the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, the last many years we've had that as a day off. I know before when my kids were much younger, it was a half day. I w would be inclined for that to stay as a day off or a full day. And so I start with day off um, because I think that has worked well. I know that pushes all the calendar things out as well. Um, but I, I, I think having a half day there uh, doesn't sit well. It, it's either on or off from my perspective and logically with where we've been um, Having it off makes more sense from my perspective Obviously others may have different opinions on that one. So with the different things certainly I agree with you on the, the election um, Just getting buses across town to the other schools will be difficult that day, you know So even if we could just close the one I, I think that's problematic um, With regard to the 23rd I, I lean strongly towards not having that day and then with regard to Thanksgiving, I would link strongly to not having that day either the 27th. Um, I know that puts a lot of pressure on the end of the year and a lot of pressure on our weather forecasting. Um, but I, I think those are the right choices from where I sit. Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, this uh, more related to the uh, elections, not the presidential election, but the others where we're proposing that teachers would park in the student parking lot and the students wouldn't essentially drive to school that day? So if I could, so the first election we have coming up is in March yep. of this year. Um, we actually have a meeting next week. We've had a few meetings, That's but we have another state meeting. primary. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we have another meeting next week with um, the town clerk, high school administration, uh, superintendent, myself. Uh, police, public buildings, and so forth. So, 
and as, as the superintendent mentioned, initially the fencing for the town hall school administration project was supposed to go up on March 1st. Right. The last meeting we had, um, they didn't think that was going to happen, and I think they said during that meeting that the fencing will not be up for March 5th, which okay. is uh, the election. So right. that being said, and I haven't gotten final word exactly when the fencing is going to go up, but anyway, with that, that whole lot would still be available. Mm -hmm. So depending on the number of spaces that are required, <laughs> the town clerk had put a document together that we have to talk about. Uh, it's not using the entire, for this election on March 5th, it's not using the, the entire staff parking lot. Uh, it's just a certain number of the student parking. I mean, student no, uh, the the oh, staff sorry, the, the staff yeah, parking right. lot. There's some spaces they'll need to cordon off, but sure. so sta some staff will be able to park there. Some staff will be able to park across the street. Turnout won't be and, as high, right? So okay, it makes so, sense. And then I think the the high school principal will have to make some determinations of for that one day in March, yep. uh, how many students can actually park there or, or have to take the bus that day. Sure. Uh, that's for this this coming election going forward like the and we should be okay for those and that's why I think the presidential election we'd have all fencing up you, you just couldn't really right. be very difficult to to do anything there well and I think if you guys I would I would request that once that meeting that conversation takes place if you guys could bring us that information because that's my concern comes into the transportation piece of it where it, are we expecting that a large number of students will one off one day want to utilize the buses like that's going to throw the whole system I think for a loop right so I while I don't have issues with having school in session and, and sure I think we need to really make a point to work that out in advance so um, if you could once that conversation happens with the clerk let us know um, I have one maybe two more one more um, I couldn't find it in here and I feel like I'm missing something glaring but why is April 18th a day off Good it, Friday. thank you <laughs> thank you I knew it was something and it wasn't listed so okay um, and then I think just in closing I'm inclined it took me like an hour to figure that <laughs> I out appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Turner I, I think the, the day before Thanksgiving I, I <coughs> I struggle with that one. I understand the idea of the early release data to get a day in, but I also wonder what participation is going to be like. So just something to think about. But thank you. Thank you. Dr. McCauley? Yep. No, thanks. Uh, so going back to the election, I was wondering if the town considered other sites, such as Shriners Auditorium. And, and the reason why I bring that up is when I was looking at the schedule, by having the high school and all the schools be off, on election day that pushes the last day of school up for snow days to that week of the 23rd and then also it's kind of hamstringing us about that Thanksgiving day uh, so just wondering if they looked at other options and if they've ex exhausted all their options yeah I, I believe they looked but I, I think the, at the end of the day that when they used shrine as before I think the money used once before it didn't go as well as they had hoped so they had approached us way back probably I think when Jeff Hall was still the town manager, and we had yeah. meetings even the end of the last school year. And you know, through the discussions, we thought that you know the high school would work. I think there's, I, I believe, and I don't know how long this has been happening. I think Amazon is using part of the space over there for parking now. Um, okay. Yeah, that's right. So there, that's uh, I think one challenge. Mm -hmm. I think another one. I don't pretend to understand all of it, but the advance notice that has to be made in terms of the decision making and notification, there's a lot more to it than just picking another <coughs> site. So sure, I, I don't, and I don't know that there's another site that they have available to them in the vicinity other than that. So yeah, I think that's why, under, understandably, came back to sort of the schools. Okay, uh, and then uh, another question, just clarifying for community's benefit and everything is the soft launch in August yeah. um, you know they kind of see the benefit you know you kind of have like that little soft launch people get back they get their feet wet but I have heard from parents and guardians that it's a bit of a struggle to change child care that week because it's so chopped up and then the kids have to be at school Wednesday Thursday but then they need to find options for Monday Tuesday Friday yeah. so I was just wondering if you could um, 
maybe explain the rationale behind that and well a couple of things I think to point out um, so first off for for some time um, uh, this is going back I think I think we made the change maybe three years ago four years the, the district used to have um, just one if I remember correctly one professional day to get things up and running yeah. and we determined um, that that's just not enough with all of the things that staff have to do or we are required to ask of them from a training standpoint it was a number of days ago that we um, we didn't add a day to the calendar because that's a contractual matter but we shifted what was the November day to that so my point in this is so now you've got those two back-to-back -back days Monday and Tuesday yep. of that week before uh, Labor Day and the Friday the contractual day as mentioned earlier of Friday off so that has now sort of squeezed it into a couple of days yeah um, so the soft launch I think as you as you described it um, I, and I've heard uh, I've heard both too I've heard that that's you know there's some benefit I, and, I, and I can I can think back to my own time as a, as a classroom teacher boy those four you know, I used to start after Labor Day but um, four days in a row is a lot for everybody yeah. uh, to get it back into routines and I'm sure our educators here might agree with that so I think there's some benefits to that but I, I think there's a con too and that's um, sure. I know I've heard that um, you know some have there thereby raised the well uh, do we just start school after Labor Day um, some districts do I don't think a lot around here do but I'm not 100% certain of that um, certainly as a school system we could have staff back before Labor Day um, contractually there's not an issue with doing that uh, and then have students start after Labor Day. My, my guess, though, would be that starting after Labor Day, boy, there's a lot of people who just don't like ending school closer to the end of June, so yep. there's the tension with that. But yep. um, it, it contractually, it can be done. Okay. No, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, and then one last question. Uh, kind of rationale behind this is if you look at the demographics, you know, the town is becoming a bit more diverse. So I was just wondering what would cause the district to consider having holidays for other cultural and religious holidays, such as like the Jewish high holidays, Lunar New Year, et cetera. What, what would trigger that? That's a great question, and I don't have a, a good answer for that, to be honest. Okay. I mean, it, you know, having knowledge of and worked in other districts that have taken additional days, mm -hmm. um, but they've always been in place uh, already yeah so you know I don't know the process or the conversations that communities may have had to get to that place um, but it's certainly one that as a committee you would have uh, the authority to do there would also be a contractual element to consider as well sure too. Uh, mr. Smiley you were next oh. and then Ms. Breeze. Oh, I was going to respond to mr. McCauley's question can I, do you can, yield? I can I yield to <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So, so you um, my my understanding is that um, holidays are prohibitive of race, religion, or faith to start with. But I do think there are some districts that have a high population of certain faiths yep. where um, student enrollment is down because of high holidays, for instance, that um, are similar to what we were talking about um, the December 23rd, you know what I mean, um, students coming to school yeah. and stuff, that because there's such a high population, and I take, um, for example, like the Ju Ju uh, Jewish uh, Judaism, um, that they have such a decline in student enrollment that there's really not enough students to really to really teach. So, like Newton, for instance, um, I believe um, observes their schools um, closed down for the high holidays because yeah. there's such a, a large population of, of Jewish um, students. So that's one of the um, indicators. Although there's no school um, that I'm aware of, because it would be discriminatory, that would uh, dock a student of a particular faith from practicing yep. and um, observing their high ho ho um, holidays. So I know that has some doing with regards to why some districts observe, as opposed to why some do not. Sure, that makes sense. So kind of like we're seeing a lot of enrollment down mm -hmm. because of that holiday, whatever it is, then it may consider having a day off. Well, exactly. Yep, makes sense. All right. So there was that memo in the packet from Desi um, about uh, religious, religious yeah, holidays yeah, yeah. and yeah. Making, sure, making sure that no students are penalized for um, observing their religious holidays. Mr. Samaha. Yeah, um, so I think having the December 23rd off, I think, is the right move. I think having school on the 23rd is a really, a really bad, <laughs> a really bad, <laughs> I mean, 
as as a as a teacher as as a parent it's just that it it needs to we need to not have school on that day <laughs> um uh, I also think that because of the situation with the presidential election, well, I mean, given the, my feelings on the 23rd and the presidential, the November presidential election, um, I think the return to the early release day before Thanksgiving, I think, makes sense um, with, with regards to not really wanting to push out the end of the school year too, too far. Um, you know, as, as people know, I work, I work in Boston and, and we bump up against the end of June every year because we don't ever start until after Labor Day. Um, and so it's, it's tough with the snow days. And um, so th that's my feelings on that. If we're going to not have school on the 23rd plus the um, presidential election day, that using that also not having school on the 27th would be, I think we should be using that as a, as a early release day. Um, I also um, echo Mr. Fennelly's um, concerns on the, the parking stuff and just thinking about like, what is the plan? You know, I mean, for, you know, anything for this year, it's, it's, it's really difficult because it's, you know, families plan, you know, if they're, you know, you know like my, you know, my kids drive to school and if all of a sudden they don't have a place to park, like that, you know, impacts everything. And you know, like, like, all right, how are they gonna, how are they gonna get there? Take the bus? Like, where's the bus stop? Like, I don't. Like, I, like these are these are things that like I haven't had to consider in, it's in a very long. Time. Registered for the bus if they've been. Yeah, driving yeah they're not there. registered for the right. bus. So, so, so like, so like, there's just like lots of there's just lots of things that, that I'm thinking about um, that if all of a sudden like. I, I would assume that you know there would be kids who'd be like, you know what, I'm just not going to go to school <laughs> today, like because they they can't can't do it. So, um, so I, I just and and I and I'm thinking for next year. I think we need there needs to be um, a real solid plan for like, you know, how, how do you determine which students get to park, come get to drive to school. Um, and then we also have to realize, you know, when there's construction over there, like, is, I don't know, I mean, however long that's going to take, that's going to impact the students, and that's going to also impact transportation, because there probably might be students, additional students taking the bus. So, like, it's going to have a huge impact. And it's actually something that I didn't consider um, kind of before <laughs> looking at this stuff. To, to, to directly to that point, so... Part of the conversations, and, and Mr. Ruggiero can speak in more to this than I can, that we have been had at the town hall school I've been building has been about the discussion of what's the minimum requirement for the students over there? Could there be overflow in another location very nearby? But there's been a lot of work because it, for most of the project, it will not occupy the entire parking lot. Right. It will have a certain segment that will need to be carved off, and there'll be a little bit of work, especially around the edges of the parking lot for sure. But there is going to be a portion, and so there may be some sort of requirement also that it's seniors and then not for that year right. um, where, where that, that would be, but that would need to be communicated well in advance and all those sorts of things. And there, there have been a lot of conversations you've been involved Yeah, in so that. one of the things, when we did this, we, we did do it in a vacuum. We included the, um, uh, uh, the high school principal and so forth and some, some information. So one of the things was he wanted to make sure once the um, Swain School lot is kind of fenced off, that there's 150 spaces available for student parking. So we've been told that there will be 150 right. spaces. So how he's going to divvy them up, that's something he's gonna work on. But it's not like all the spaces are gone. Um, even when they put the fencing up in March, as an example, that wouldn't be the whole Swain lot. Mm -hmm. In the summer, it's a different story because they have to do some work underneath the whole parking lot. So for, you know, once school's out through the end of August, most likely that whole parking lot is going to be fenced off. Um, but, it, you know, they know the kids have to park there, so. Ms. Burns? Um, quickly, I think when the high school was built, I do believe that St. Thomas uh, was kind enough to allow some student parking in the, in the back of their lot, but to keep the, uh, the front of their lot open in case of, um, 
uh, church business. So um, I, I know that when the high school was being built, that was, they did, so I don't know how it was done, if it was part and partial um, or a similar, um, you know, only certain st seniors could park or something to that effect. But I, I, I thought I recalled that there was, that they afforded us parking in the, the back of the lot. Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't remember that. I know that the workers that worked on the high school parked there. Okay, maybe perhaps um, that was it. Much bigger project and so forth. So whereas the town hall school admin, the workers are gonna park at that site. For the high school, they had to have off-site parking, if you will. And, and I can't remember if students parked over there, but I know that the construction workers, a lot of them parked over there. All right, I thought, I, I, I just recall that I know that yeah, they I were. I can't remember, but I can. All right, thank you. So I, I think that there are, there are clearly sort of three key places in the calendar where we need to make decisions. So the day before Thanksgiving, the presidential election and the December 23rd. That's really kind of what, <coughs> excuse me, what all the, all the discussion is about. Um, and the different considerations, um, unfortunately, like a lot of things that you just get trade-offs. Like there's no one perfect solution that, uh, you know, make sure that every instructional day really counts as a good instructional day and we have good attendance and we don't go too late into the year and we don't have, you know, the problems of holding school during a presidential election. So it's all about trade-offs, and uh, I think that the um, I think that closing school, uh, the district on the president's election, just really makes a lot of sense for all the reasons I won't re recap, but uh, for all the reasons that have been put forward, I think I think that that makes sense um, to close it then. Um, I share generally um, Mr. Turner's dislike of early release days. Um, not only do they generally just not get <laughs> a lot done. Uh, honestly, it sometimes seems like, you know, the kids are coming home. It's like, didn't you just go out the door? I just put you on the bus. How are you back already? Especially with uh, if you have, like, separation between the start times. I used your, to love them when I kids. was in school. I don't know what you all talking about. Uh, yeah, the, the early release days. And um, and, and then they're also, they also honestly create a lot of headaches for working parents who are, like, trying to figure out, like, how do we get them off? But then in the middle of the day, um, have to suddenly go and fetch them or, um, or make sure that someone's home. Uh, so I'm also not a huge fan. So I, my inclination is to stick with having the day before Thanksgiving off. Um, but that does cut against my other inclination, which is to not go too far into June. And if we lose that as one of our 180 days, it just gets added on uh, to, the end of the, to the end of the calendar. Um, the December 23rd, I have to say that before hearing some of the discussion here, I was pretty pro school on December 23rd. Uh, I just, I don't know, having almost two weeks off for that break just seemed like an awful lot. And again, pushing everything later into June if we don't have uh, school on those days. But I think that hearing some of the discussion here, I'm more persuaded that it's like, yeah, it'll give us a day that we can count towards 180, but it's not gonna be much of anything. Um, I mean, the day before you know the holiday break, no teacher wants to get into anything deep. It's like, you know, a lot of people are watching movies and kind of having fun. It's not a huge instructional day um, the day before winter break, and it would be even less so on the 23rd. Um, so I think, I think I'm kind of being persuaded uh, that that is maybe not a, a good use of our school days to, to have a session, session then. Um, one other thing I just want to mention, because and this kind of ties in a little bit to what um, Dr. Mercalli was saying about um, about religious holidays, and I don't think this is something for this year, but something just to kind of just plant an idea that it might be worthwhile um, looking at uh, Good Friday and whether it makes sense to continue uh, taking that day off. And again, we've largely done years ago when we made some of these changes, for example, the change to the day before Thanksgiving, we did a pretty comprehensive survey of the district, um, both of the staff and the families about like, what do you like? Do you still want to start before or after Labor Day? Do you like having the Friday off before Labor Day? And there's that four day, uh, that four day Labor Day weekend and so forth. And you know, we asked a whole bunch of things about, you know, would you attend school um, on Good Friday and so forth? And you know, we, that was something that we, um, for, for largely kind of just like both on our staff and on our students, we kind of just said like, you know, there are a lot of people that just aren't going to be there. And uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to try and hold, try and hold school that day. Um, but it is kind of an outlier on our calendar. It's the only really purely religious holiday that uh, that we uh, that we take off. Um,
And um, I think as I, well, as I said, not something for this year, but something just to kind of be mm -hmm. um, be thinking about moving um, be thinking about moving forward. Dr. McCauley. Yeah, to just follow that up. I, you know, <laughs> if we're going to have a day around Easter, I feel the Monday after Easter would be probably better for in case people are traveling for Easter. And also there's a quirk with Massachusetts where we don't have spring break around Easter like most other states do too because we have Patriots Day. So that definitely adds another wrinkle into that as well too. Ms. Burns. Um, just to get on the record, I am um, a supporter of Half Day before Thanksgiving. Now, just to get it on the record with Jay. Um, <laughs> but I will say I think in the future when the board is ready to take it up for discussion, I think getting a poll um, with regards to who observes because it is a high holiday in the Catholic faith. So um, depending upon what s staff members may uh, practice may be a de um, determining factor in how many substitutes you may need on Good Friday and if you can um, fill the classroom. So I think when the board is prepared to do so that perhaps great, great to, that it's contractual but it is something that you may want to pull um, the uh, uh, at, le at least the um, educators and the staff um, in, in the district to see how many practice because um, it, it is a day of atonement um, and, and and so that's all I would um, suggest. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that we, we wouldn't want to make a I wouldn't want to make a change like that without surveying oh, the of district and, and getting more. I know religious practices and faith and um, ha has changed in the past you know 50 years, but there's still some. Very um, devout. So, anyway, okay, Mr. Turner. Yeah, the last last thing on that point, I think just a request to Dr. Marcaldi's point. I'm assuming that as part of your annual review of attendance and uh, of students, that if something started to pop, like okay, you know, this particular holiday of X or Y faith, we're now seeing consistently an extra, you know, whatever percent. That that would be something that you would have. There's a threshold where you say, okay, we do need to evaluate this one or these these ones to understand whether or not they would apply. I'm presuming that's part of the process, and if it's not, I mean, yeah, it's not necessarily that's right. every year. It could be you know a, a summative thing every two or three years of just a, a general look back to make sure we aren't missing a trend that's coming <coughs> along that could impact how we need to do the schedule to make sure we have good attendance on most school days. And, and if I may, there's the, I mean, the Juneteenth holiday, certainly at the end of June, is another sort of wrinkle, a newer development that is, I, I look at that also as I'm sure you do, tricky. And, you know, the last official day in this version, uh, the first version would be the 13th, right, with no snow days. You know, whether it be excessive heat at the beginning of the year or, or uh, snow days, I think it's inevitable, uh, unfortunately, that we're going to, we would go into that week of the 16th, but three days, uh, certainly it would be great to then be able to end on the 18th of the other most. Um, looking ahead, Juneteenth the following year, I know that's a long ways off, uh, the 26th is on June 19th as a Friday, and then the next year is on a Saturday. So, but I'm also cognizant of that, as I'm sure you are as well too. Um, there's no guarantees, <laughs> but three days to play with, so to speak, and to take it, you know, I, I think that that's probably a reasonable, and I don't know the number of, you know, every year is obviously so different, but, um, you know, and I guess I only point that out to say if there's some back to the December day, or sorry, the November day, the 27th, um, you know, three days seems to be, I think, a reasonable amount of days to, well, yeah. yeah. So um, based upon your feedback, uh, you know, looking for direction, obviously, to come back uh, with a version that reflects uh, the overall uh, will of the committee, are, are you, do you think you're at that point yet, or do you want? Assuming the majority would have them observe the 27th and the 23rd, so there's no school? Uh, well, I think I, I sense that there was general agreement about no school on the 23rd, mm -hmm. can someone correct me, yep. and about taking the November 5th off I think maybe there's still <coughs> some issue about the day before Thanksgiving um, I didn't feel that there is as much did you want to did you want to this is this is put in as a first read so I'd be interested in dr. Bryson's yeah. input regardless if, if she too was an agreement of um, which I, she may be um, of the Wednesday before as being um, a day off but um, I'm just I'm just thinking let, let me ask it this way. Is anyone interested in seeing a calendar other than the two that we have before us now? 
I think I think leaving the the first one that has twenty third as is is one option, and the and instead of the other option where we have the twenty third as a day on, you have that one show with the twenty seventh as a day off, and have those two options for the next conversation. So I'm, I'm so, sorry, excuse. So yeah, one 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 is as shown in what's called first read. Yes. The other one, the oh, second the, one November is 27th the December break modified, would still have the 23rd as a day off, but would show the 27th as also a day off and the impact that has at the end of the year. Because that way we've got the two options on the one day that's in question now, and we could have that conversation. So is that uh, all that matters, whether to, to have to have early release or not to have? Or have a day, a day off? Is day that off, the only? That's the only thing that appears to be in question. That seems yeah. to be the one. Yeah. And then we could have that conversation next time. I think we need to create two, two, necessary, two calendars, per se, outside of just, OK, how do you want to flow with that? Because it really is just that one point of Right. So invention. essentially, like the, the second edition calendar, which right now is based on a difference in the 23rd, take that off, yeah. again, from the consensus we said before, and instead make this one that uh, doesn't have the half day on the 27th. Yeah. For us Agreed. I think that, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. All right, any further questions? Okay, that takes us to, we have no old business today, that brings us to subcommittee reports. Any subcommittee reports? Burns. So, um, I, as I touch, only when I speak, right? <laughs> you have gotten timered a couple of times. No, today. third time's the charm. Um, as I said, I, I think I would like to just um, see if we can reconvene the uh, school committee handbook, member handbook um, committee, just so we can kind of tackle it. I don't think it's really difficult. I th just think it's more time consuming. Um, so that's the first thing. And I'll um, send Tracy an email to members um, with who regards the, who are, to. Who are the members of that subcommittee? Sorry? Uh, who are the members of that subcommittee? Look, the, it's in your packet. Please. I see. <laughs> Where? I was actually just about to look. I think it was I Jay. Just about to look you were, it up. Hold I think on, you were one. <laughs> like, like, that's, that's really what I want to know. Is I think, it me? I think it was you were one. Dave was one at well, one point. I think Bryson might be one of those. Is she? I'm looking she it up right now. She was or she is now. Okay. I can't remember. It was last. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. So. Tell you in one second, guys. Yes, handbook subcommittee. Yeah, it's on The handbook protocol subcommittee is MJ, Jen, and Jay. <laughs> so the answer is yes. yes. Okay. So you're mine. So, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll email, um, I'll ask Tracy to see if we can email sometimes. Uh, um, uh, and Dr. Brandon, I'd like for you to participate as you have sure. to add your insight if that's, um, because it, it, it it's primarily to help any new onboarding members um, just to kind of get the lay of the land, just the foundational aspect. So, um, which is a good kind of segue um, that uh, into my next topic, which is um, I'd like to notify um, the board and the, the district's leadership and staff and the community that um, I am not planning on running in April. So my seat will be, um, will be available um, for elections. Um, so it, um, it's very difficult for me to stand here because this board and the work um, that I've been fortunate to do um, for the past 12 years is, is a part of my fabric and who I am. So it's um, a very difficult um, decision, but uh, my personal life has uh, made it so that I can't uh, put forth the action behind the work that we do, which is so vital in, into moving um, education in our district um, forward um, doesn't mean I, I my passion I'm just as passionate and and I don't think being you know being Portuguese I'll always be a vocal set so I I do hope um, it is my intention and I will save um, a longer diatribe for April but um, it is my hope to continue at some capacity whether it be to volunteer um, on a committee a subcommittee for the district or what other, uh, whatever other capacity I could be utilized. Um, but um, so in saying that, um, I would welcome anybody who may be interested in this position to feel free to reach out if there are, and to any one of our members um, to inquire um, about um, 
possibly pulling papers and running for the, the seat. Um, it is a very rewarding, um, it is a lot of hard work, but it is very rewarding um, work um, in the very least. Um, and um, I, I, I know I'll say this again, but I, I just want to um, sincerely um, thank my, the board members I've served with, the superintendents I've served with. I'm divorcing you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the community that I've had the pleasure of um, having the trust. Um, and uh, I hope I've served you well and your, and your children. Um, but, I, and, but this is on, certainly not to say that I'm not gonna um, work um, hard until the, the last day. Um, I've got a lot of irons in the fires that I'm hoping that I can accomplish um, a lot of it before the end of my term um, with the help of my, my help of my colleagues. So, but um, I, I thank you for a great 12 years and um, very good. I don't think, I, I think that's all I have to say, but thank you. <laughs> Thank well, you. There'll be Perfect. much, much more to say later, but yes. um, thank you for your 12 years of service. Thank you. Um, to the children of Wilmington. It's my absolute pleasure. It really is. Uh, all right. Item nine, correspondence? Um, none this evening. All right. Future committee dates and other notable items. Uh, February 1st, of the <coughs> MSBA Wildwood Project Community Forum, uh, 6.30 p.m. over Zoom. Uh, February 7th is the next Wildwood School Building Committee meeting, 6 p.m. here in this room. Uh, the 13th um, <clears throat> will be our LGBTQIA plus parent discussion group uh, at 6 p.m., which is going to be both live here and also available virtually. Uh, February 14th is our next regular uh, school committee meeting and our budget hearing. Uh, and then the 19th is the beginning of the February break. Anything, Stephen, that I was uh, missing I from? I thought there was a meeting tomorrow night I for the Wildwood. There's a Wildwood School Building Committee yeah, meeting tomorrow night. That's, that's the one that, that rung a bell. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, a couple of questions. Um, is that the form flyer that's yeah, in our the packet? The form flyer that's is in the first. packet, okay. yes. Yeah, that's the um, I also, um, two questions, one of which is the uh, town manager's budget presentation. Um, it, it is typical that um, representation from this board is, is there in the, in, in the audience. Not that it's necessary, but it's helpful. Um, just, to, just to say that if anybody has that flexibility within their um, schedule to do so. Um, I also would like, um, because I do think it's important just to make note for those people who don't scour our packets that on February 13th between 6 and 7 in the high school, um, this group instruction room, the um, LGBTQIA parent discussion group will take place with Erin Durnham and Sarah Jean Phillips um, presenting. Um, social, it's for social, emo they're the social emotional um, and family engagement specialists. So if, um, if anybody is interested in partaking and participating um, either in person or via Zoom. Um, I highly encourage you going. I believe it would, it, I believe it's on our website, this, e yes. this event. District calendar. Just thank you, district calendar to um, look into it, um, uh, it uh, if anyone has additional interest. Uh, but I, I, I do think, I, th I think it's a great support me uh, mechanism <coughs> for our diverse um, student body and um, families who support, um, and, and, and their families. That's the end of our agenda. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion by Ms. Burns, second by Mr. Samaha. All in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.